Pero, ano ba siya? Hindi okay lang tayo ng project na yun. Pero maano ba siya? Smart ka na ba siya?
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is your moderator. We will start in two minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Thursday once again, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series where we discuss development issues based on data and evidence. I'm Sheila CR, and I will be moderating this event. For those of you who are joining our webinar for the first time, please be aware of our house rules. Uh, for all attendees, uh, your microphone is muted upon entry, and this is to prevent any background noise. To join the open forum, just use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of the screen. Just uh, type your name and your affiliation and your question. Please make uh, sure that your questions are concise as much as possible. You will be called during the open forum, and this means that we will unmute your microphones or I will uh, read your question from the chat box. For those of you who are joining us on Facebook, uh, you are also very much encouraged to participate in our discussion. Just use the uh, comment section of Facebook for your questions. In support of this year's uh, Nutrition Month, our webinar for today will tackle the topic on uh, early childhood care and development. So we will see the realities on the ground and we will discuss ways on how we can, we can improve um, the access and uh, delivery of health and nutrition programs for children in our local communities. And to formally open our event, and uh, share her insights about the topic. Here is the president of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Dr. Celia Reyes. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First, allow me to acknowledge uh, some of our friends who are attending this afternoon's webinar. Um, we have um, Director Jan Aris Makaspak from uh, the Department of Bureau and, and Management. Uh, we have Director Annalisa Bonagua, um, from the Department of Interior and Local Government. We have Director uh, Dominador Gamboa from the House of Representatives, CPBRD. Uh, we have Director Maria Cristina Pardalis from the Senate Economic Planning Office and uh, Executive Director Bernardino Sayo from the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines. We're also joined uh, this afternoon by um, Dean Evelyn Del Mundo from the Cavite State University. Um, Director Melvin Habar from the Social Development Research Center of De La Salle University. Associate Dean Mitzi Conchada from the De La Salle University. Um, Dean Roland, Roland Conanan from Martinez Memorial College. Um, Dean Jocelyn Rivera Lutap from Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Dean Elmer De Jose from uh, Polytechnic University of the Philippines. And um, Dr. Corazon Barba. Professor Emeritus from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Um, this afternoon, we also have representatives from the CSO. We have Dr. Laila Africa, President of the Philippine Society of Nutritionist Dietitians. Um, Dr. Erika Tabua, um, Board Member of the Philippine Society of Nutritionist Dietitians. Um, Mr. Hector Tubaran Jr. from the Save the Children Philippines 
Miss Jessica Cantos, co-convener, Social Watch Philippines, and we're happy that again, uh, Dr. Gilbert Yanto, who's uh, the former president of PIDS and member of our board of trustees, is joining us this afternoon. For those who are attending the, uh, for the first time, we're, we hold this virtual seminar every week to disseminate the completed studies of PIDS. It's good that we have new technologies and platforms to keep us informed and connected, especially during this time when face-to-face -face meetings or gatherings are impossible due to the pandemic. So thank you all for being with us on this online seminar. Today's topic is timely as we celebrate the National Nutrition Month this July. This afternoon, three of our research fellows will be presenting the integrated report of several studies done by PIDS on early childhood care and development in the first 1,000 days in three selected areas, namely Northern Samar, Western Samar, and Zamboanga del Norte. Senior Research Fellow Connie Dahoykoy, Senior Research Fellow uh, Michael Abrigo, and um, Senior Research Fellow Kobe Tabuga will discuss their findings on various factors affecting local mobilization of ECCD, F1KD interventions in relation to policy, leadership and governance, program and service delivery, and the nurturing care practices of parents and caregivers in these areas. They will also share best and our promising practices they gather from their research, including the gaps and challenges of ECCD F1KD programs and services on the ground. Most importantly, we will be hearing from them recommendations on how to resolve these gaps. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge at this point the support that we got from UNICEF to be able to conduct all of these studies. So why is the first 1,000 days crucial in the life of a child? According to scientific researchers and medical experts, this period, which starts from pregnancy up to two years, is critical in a child's development. It is during this period that proper nutrition, health care, early education, and other nurturing interventions should be given to ensure the optimal development of a child, both mentally and physically. Poor nutrition during this stage can result to adverse and lasting effects on the child's development that can eventually affect his or quality of life as an adult. As explained by the World Health Organization, malnutrition comes in different forms, such as undernutrition, which includes wasting, um, stunting, and underweight. It could also refer to micronutrient-related malnutrition, which can, which can include either micronutrient deficiencies or micronutrient excess. Another manifestation of malnutrition is obesity or being overweight. The WHO revealed that globally around 45% of deaths among children under five years of age are related to undernutrition. And this is mostly observed in low and middle income countries. Sad to say that the Philippines is among the countries with the highest cases of malnutrition worldwide. Official nutrition statistics based on the National Nutrition Survey in 2018 show that 2 in 10 Filipino children under 5 years old were underweight. Specifically, about 30% of children were stunted or too short for their age, while about 6% of children were wasted or too thin for their height. Moreover, about 4% of children were considered as overweight. Among children below 2 years old, about 15% were underweight, while about 3% were overweight. Among the, over, among the identified causes of undernutrition include inadequate diet, poor hygiene and childcare practices, and incomplete immunization, among others. In response to malnutrition issues, the government has drafted strategies and targets through the Philippine Plan of Action on Nutrition, or what we call PPAN, for the period 2017 to 2022. This is the country's framework of action to address the nutrition needs of Filipinos. The enactment of RA11148 in 2018, also known as the Kalusugan at Nutrition Magnanay Act, or the First 1000 Days Law, is also a welcome development as it responds to the health and nutrition problems of vulnerable groups, such as pregnant women and lactating mothers, including children from birth up to 24 months. But then again, curbing malnutrition is not just the responsibility of the government. It needs the support of other sectors to be able to improve the conditions, especially of children at risk in the country. With that, let me thank you once again for joining this webinar. I look forward to hearing your insights during the open forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamsel. So as mentioned by uh, Dr. Dr. Reyes, we have three uh, 
presenters uh, today. They're all research fellows of PIDS, and each of them will be presenting the, re the results of their case studies. And now our uh, first presenter will be um, uh, Aubrey Tabuga. In her uh, two decades stint at the Institute, Dr. Tabuga's work on various research topics, including international migration and remittances, poverty, uh, disability, gender, health, and nutrition, policy analysis, and social networks. Dr. Tabuga obtained her uh, PhD in public policy from the Lee Kuan, Yew, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Here now is Dr. Tabuga, who will give us a project overview and the findings of uh, their study in Western Samar. It's a pleasure to share with you today the findings um, from our from our study, um, which we did uh, at the local level. So um, first, I will provide an overview of the project. Then I will proceed to the findings um, of my case, uh, which is Samar or Western Samar. My colleagues will then follow and present their key findings. And after that, I will provide some general recommendations, although they may also have specific recommendations based on the cases they examined. We'd like to thank Dr. Reyes for providing a good overview of the importance of looking into efforts that promote um, F1KD or, or first 1,000 days. So we will be focusing now on the findings of the study. So the study examined uh, various key factors that influence the delivery of programs and services related to ECCD F1KD or early child uh, Early Childhood uh, Development, uh, first 1,000 days, outcomes in the localities. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, this study was commissioned by the UNICEF. So um, the areas of focus um, that UNICEF um, was interested in, which we looked at, um, are or were policy, leadership, and governance first, and then second, programs and services delivery, and, and then nurturing care practices of parents and caregivers of young children. But we also look into contextual factors. So for policy leadership and governance, we examined um, LGU's prioritization, planning process, their financing. We also look into the aspects of monitoring and evaluation. And we also examined local leaders' awareness, interests, and commitment to F1KD. For the delivery of programs and services, we examined the roster of programs at the LGU level. And then we also look at the inputs and processes under the building blocks of nurturing care system. And these are the roles and structures, human resource, the, the processes of implementation, health facilities, equipment, and supplies, and information and communication. Aside from um, policy uh, governance and then program uh, implementation, we also gathered information about the prevailing knowledge, beliefs, preferences and practices of parents and caregivers with respect to the nurturing care components, which are good health, adequate nutrition, responsive caregiving, opportunities for learning, and security and safety. So this is the scope of our study. We studied the cases of Northern Samar, Samar, and Zamboanga del Norte through the municipalities that we have shown here. So for instance, uh, for Northern Samar, we examined the case of Catarman and Lope de Vega. For Samar or Western Samar, we examined two cities, Calbayog City and Catbalogan City. And for Zamboanga del Norte, we examined um, the specific cases of Sindangan and Leon Pastigo. As you can see, the LGUs we visited vary by capacity and resources as proxied by their income class. The malnutrition situation also varies as shown by different rates of stunting. And so this diversity in the study cases um, was important for us to gain greater understanding of the situation in these areas. Next, please. For our main approach for gathering data, we, uh, we conducted focus group discussions and key informant interviews. And these were the persons or officials uh, whom we interacted with based on the discussion themes that we had. For policy directions, um, resources, and m &E, we talked to the leaders or the local chief executives um, and the policy makers. For the services and programs um, implemented in the areas, we interviewed uh, program managers, um, 
implementers and frontline workers. And for the nurturing care practices um, and access to services, we talk to parents and caregivers in the areas. Next, please. We also used um, administrative data from these LGUs and also we, we used their records and monitoring systems and we basically did qualitative analysis. Next, please. Now for the key findings in summer, um, but let me just first acknowledge the, the other members of the summer team, uh, Mr. Carlos Caballero and Ms. Bles Mendez. Next, please. We examined the cases of Kalbaig City and Katbalogan uh, City in, in summer. And um, this is because we, we see variation in the performances of these two cities with respect to stunting prevalence, income class, and land area. So Kalbayog City is a huge city. Um, they said it's the third largest city in the country. It's a first class city, um, but it has relatively higher stunting rate um, based on 2017 data. Katbalogan City, meanwhile, um, is a fifth class city with relatively low stunting rate um, based on, again, 2017 data and a relatively smaller area than, uh, or a significantly smaller area uh, than Kalbayog City. Next, please. So these are the maps um, of the two cities. Um, on the right, we we can see Katbalogan's map showing the concentration of population near the Bay Area or near towards the left side of the, of the map. It also has some island barangays there. And then on the left side is Kalbayog City, which is, with its relatively dispersed population, which um, says a lot um, about difficulty of reaching all people uh, in the area. And both of these cities, um, Katbalogan and Kalbayog cities, um, they have um, GIDAS or geographically isolated and, and disadvantaged areas. For the results in terms of policy, leadership, and governance. Okay, so the LGUs prioritize to some extent health and nutrition and allocate funds um, to its programs. But um, these did not comprise or these do not comprise the top priorities, which are usually um, infrastructure related. These are based on um, on insights or, or opinions of the people we we have interviewed. It is very challenging also to objectively assess where ECC, the F1 KD is in sectoral priorities because the resources that go into the implementation of such programs are lumped with various um, aspects. For instance, the F1 KD. Um, resources are lumped in the in the health um in the city health office uh, and then for instance if you provide if they provide like supplies or advocacy programs under F1KD these are lumped um with the overall um budget of or expenditures in supplies and advocacy so it's there is it's really it's really difficult to sort of separate how much is going um to F1KD efforts but we can we can see and we have seen in the in our study that there is now greater focus on nutrition. Um, there are so many um, active uh, people working on nutrition on the ground. Next, please. We just want to show you here the increasing trend of health health expenditures in Katbalogan City. And next, please. And this is also the case uh, for Kal Kalbayog City. Next, please. We also found that. Um, the support of the LCE or the local chief executive is very crucial in getting programs like um, F1KD funded uh, and implemented. And um, however, while different sectoral committees and barangays prepare, deliberate, and carry out uh, consultations to determine the programs, projects, and activities, the upper hand on which programs are included and funded rests on the local chief executive. Also, while there is some awareness on the extent of malnutrition problem among leaders, the level of perception um, that we gathered um, on the average is not to the level that merits urgency and high priority in the local government agenda. So when we ask them and um, about uh, how important, for instance, F1KD is or how, how important mal the malnutrition problem is, they would say that, yes, it is, it's, it's, um, it's a problem, but when you look at, when you ask them uh, about their priorities, um, it's not on, on the top of the agenda. In terms of planning, um, we found that ECCD F1KD planning is fragmented um, with 
quite um, with, with little integration. And when we talk to the officials, they would say that usually the problem is about lack of time. And uh, um, I think this, uh, this warrants further examination. We also found that different agencies conduct their own internal planning and targeting. So their inputs are usually gathered and developed into the plan or the, the, the city nutrition action plan. And we found that among the cases that we've looked at, the quality of LNAP or the local nutrition action plan also varies. We also found that the level of interaction among members of the, of the nutrition committee at the local level also varies um, across areas. There are those which have regular meetings, but there are also those which um, rarely, if at all, meet to discuss the CNAP. So the general process is that um, they, the, the, the person in charge of, of putting up the CNAP is that um, he or she will just go around the units of the, of the local government and then get their, their programs, their nutrition related programs, and they would they would just be consolidated into just uh, into the CNAP. But they don't um, sort of meet together and talk about their integrated efforts. In terms of financing, there is definitely lack of resources that go into, um, into the financing of ECCD F1KD. Um, for instance, for conducting feeding programs, equipment and supplies, and we have we have found this or we have uh, seen this through um, them not meeting their targets for, for instance, in terms of number of children that they're going to, to cater and they're going to, to feed in their feeding programs. And also in terms of their lack of equipment and supplies in their OPT or operation timbang um, um, processes or operations. We also gathered that there are significant bottlenecks in procurement and this inhibits swift response to the needs of mothers and their young children in terms of addressing malnutrition. And when we examine this more deeply, the, their problem really is in even in cities, for instance, in, in the in those areas that we looked at, there are difficulties of looking at of looking into uh, adequate numbers of suppliers. Um, the suppliers would not want the supply without uh, first uh, being paid. So, um, and their some of their problems also are in terms of, for instance, their back um, the their bids and awards uh, committees, um, who um, do not meet regular regularly in in a, in, a, in a manner that is quite frequent that they can be reached whenever they're needed. In terms of monitoring and evaluation, um, the main tool or data used by the local level um, are the OPT results. I, I know that, that they also use other sort of um, monitoring systems, but the main tool that they use for that um, are the OPT um, data that they gather. However, there is the issue of timeliness in terms of the OPT results. Um, the, the process of the OPT takes um, at least eight months to complete um, that process and then the BNS and the BHWs uh, who are working on these OPTs, they're in need of basic training or retraining. So when we talk to the, the midwives, they say that, oh, the BNS, they, they need to be retrained every time there's an OPT operation. At the same time, they also lack the equipment, the anthropometric, anthropometric equipment. They also lack computers, for instance, um, they just use one computer for encoding all the data um, from the different um, barangays and there's just one person doing all the encoding. So a very few oh, very few of them are computer literate. There's also the issue of data quality. Um, the equipment uh, or tools that they use um, are not similar or not standard. Others use different methods of getting the weight of children. And also there's this um, issue with the OPT coverage. Um, so even if um, they're they're saying that they, this is the coverage, sometimes the problem is, are they really reaching all, all the children? Or later on, um, Dr. Abrigo will also discuss about um, the problem of the denominator in the OPT. Next, please. OK, so um, a crucial deficiency um, that we found is really the lack of m and &E and the lack of capacity for m and &E or monitoring and evaluation. They do implement programs. Um, when, we, um, when we did this study, we found really that local governments, they really do a lot. They do, do things and they conduct programs. However, they rarely or they do not really closely monitor um, the 
what they're doing or whether they're getting the goals or they are meeting the targets that they've set or whether they have targets at all. So they just keep on doing things and um, there are, we found a lot of efforts that they do. However, they do not really monitor them. And so I think this is uh, one of the, the key deficiencies that we found in this, this study. And yeah, there are um, there were assessments. There's the OPT, there are information um, from meetings um, with PNS. They, that's how they, they monitor things. They often conduct these meetings. Um, however, uh, it's also it's also a problem when you don't get the accomplishments reports right away uh, from different agencies, and so that is the the problem in terms of really sort of improving your efforts if you're not monitoring them and, and if you don't know whether they're working or not, then that's that's really a problem. And for instance, for, for the CNAO or the, the City Nutrition Action Officers, MNE for them is very challenging because uh, being a CNAO is merely a designation, which means that it's an additional job um, to uh, an already overworked um, an, um, staff or, or officer. So, for instance, in one of the cities, the CNAO is um, a medical officer who is also overseeing a blood, a blood bank. And so to go to the 157 barangays um, of that city is really, is really something. So he, the, the, the load is really heavy. And so m and &E is, is, is not really the, the priority there. In terms of organizational structure, um, the organizational structure for nutrition varies by locality. Others are more fragmented than others. Um, sometimes when the intention is to have greater focus, um, ng fragmentation. So program components are spearheaded by different units. So um, same component are, are implemented by different units. For instance, BNS and BHWs, they report to different program leaders, but they're working on the same um, program. And with fragmentation, coordination problems are more likely. So it, it would be very important to set or set protocols or standards. And um, yeah, so setting standards and protocols is challenging when there is a lot of fragmentation in the system. The structure of local nutrition committees vary across LGU. So one has more sort of balanced representation than the other. So for instance, in another case, you would see that Indisha well distributed to members from the different units um, from the LGU. Like for instance, masyadong madaming people from, from one unit uh, compared to the other. And um, um, although um, although okay naman siya, but when, when, we, when we talk to people, it seems that Sabi nila, hindi ata maganda because sometimes when, when they want sanitation officers there, um, iba yung nailalagay. So there are a lot of, of dynamics uh, going on in terms of the, the structure of the local nutrition committees. And uh, apart from, from that, um, there are also changes in structure um, during political transition. So the free, these frequent changes um, um, may adversely affect the long-term trajectory and sustainability of the programs. In terms of program and service delivery, we found that the, the F1KD is not yet formally institutionalized at the LGU level. So when we went there, um, it's still on the process of putting things together uh, para umusad yung program. Uh, at the barangay level, uh, we found that the, the, the barangay officials will not implement the program without um, um, uh, policy making at the local level. So kung walang local resolution yung LGU, hindi gagalaw yung, yung barangays. And um, so many of the programs and services related to it are publicly provided naman na in the community as part of separate programs on maternal and child health, family planning, early child, uh, early child care and development and nutrition among others. So. Even if the F1KD, the, the Lord, the F1KD itself is not yet, uh, formally institutionalized at the local level, many of its components um, are already running um, for, for many years. In terms of the F1KD checklist, um, we found that some programs that ought to be implemented are still not being um, implemented. So for instance, Kat Balogan, um, um, is not monitoring many of the components. Um, in Katbalogan, 
the, the programs that are not yet um, implemented are nutrition counseling and provision of nutritious food and meals for mothers and counseling to parents, caregivers on responsive care and stimulation for infants um, and children. Sa Kalbayog naman, um, these are the, the, the programs that are not yet implemented, the, the PHIC or the field health enrollment and linkages to community based health workers and volunteers. For both Kat Kalbayog and Katbalogan, um, they're still not implementing the lactation breaks for women in the workplace, which is implemented only um, in a few instances. And then the provision of lactation stations in the workplace and the organization of breastfeeding support group in workplace. So for those um, who are not aware um, of the ECCD um, F1KD checklist, there is a long list of of things that the local governments must uh, must implement. But then, um, although as I've said earlier, uh, many of the components of the programs have already been or are already running for many many years, um, there are still part of the the checklist that there they are still that they are yet to implement in the future. One of the opportunities or one of the positive um, findings that we got, um, at least for the summer, is that uh, the collaborative efforts were found to be promising um, and they present opportunities for better implementation on the ground. So there is cooperation among the departments, um, albeit at varying levels. And um, when we when I say when I say collaborative efforts, what they do is that when they go to a certain barangay that they tar they've targeted, for instance, for 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 feeding program, they also talk to the different units like the veterinary, um, the veterinarian, the city veterinarian, veterinarian, the sanitary officer, and then these um, these units they would uh, come together in that same area and provide different um, services. Like they would provide seedlings, and then they would provide some some livestock to the families of the the malnourished children. So I think in that area. Um, there, there is uh, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, however, as I've mentioned earlier, the problem is in the planning. We don't know really um, what happened to the seedling, or we don't know what happened to the livestock um, that they prov provided to the family. So, it really it's really down to the MNE also and to the planning. In terms of human resources, um, public health workers, um, as as you may know already, and and as is the case in other other parts of the country, it's scarce um, relative to the workload, and most are in need of further um, capacity building or retraining. And when we, we and when we ask them in which particular aspect do they need a retraining, it's in the infant and young child uh, feeding and in terms of the nutritional assessment. As I've mentioned earlier, the CNAOs are over overburdened um, with multiple roles. And also midwives are overburdened also. And um, we examined um, the the assignment of population for midwives. So what we did here is that we just looked at the different barangays um, assigned to the midwives, and then we just like summed the population for, for each mid midwife, for instance. Um, so if this midwife is assigned to this cluster of, of barangays and um, how many people are there. So we, we just sort of played around it and we found that um, there are a lot of, 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 of unevenness. So um, yung iba meron silang kinikater na 10,000, yung iba 1,000. And when we, when we validated this with um, people uh, from the area, from the, from the um, staff or from the officials in the LGUs, we found that this is because um, Yes, 1,000 na yung kinikator nito, pero this is a gida and the other one is, um, it's a, it's a, a city proper and then people have access to other like health providers. And so that is um, sort of, of okay, um, but then it would be good for them to also closely examine um, any further um, efforts to sort of improve the distribution. And also um, we found that um, frontline workers are also need retraining on OPD and also interpersonal communication. We also found uh, when we examined the clusters of barangays, so for each uh, barangay health station, there is a cluster of barangays that this BHS uh, caters to or serves. And then we, we just sort of colored the clusters with the same color. And then we found that um, 
some clustering of barangays may need to be re-examined. And this is the case for LGUs that have a wide land area and, and LGUs that have uh, geographically um, geographic constraints such as, as Calbayog City, for instance. So when you look at this map, there are there are like neon green na naka, naka, naka hiwalay from the rest and uh, when we when we ask them why is this um and we were thinking um, amongst ourselves maybe there's a mountain there and it this is uh, this cluster is more more sort of accessible than that but um we we talked to them and we said they may need to re-examine the assignments um in terms of clustering uh, of the barangays so that we will not uh, we we would be uh, we we help our midwives in terms of catering to these people because if you if the midwife is going from here and there and that would be very uh, difficult for them. Next, please. In terms of accessibility facilities, supplies, um, and information and communication, we found that people in Gida are are indeed disadvantaged. In one case, uh, we found that no midwives are assigned in some Gidas um, with no regular volunteers in these areas um, because uh, these areas are not organized due to problems of, of security and conflict. Um, and there's really significant geographic constraints. So when we ask them how how far are these or how difficult to reach these areas and one um, interviewee told us that uh, he would need like six hours um, one way to go on foot to these areas. Like these are not, these are not reachable by um, by vehicles. Um, in another case, um, we found that midwives are able to serve the, the Gida areas. And I think this is down to the, the variation in terms of reachability of the areas. But we definitely found that there is lack of barangay health stations. Um, many, many barangay health stations are concentrated in population areas. We also found that there are delays in supplies and we found that the short, short shelf life of nutrition supplies. So for instance, um, when the supplies reach, for instance, the provincial office, it's that it already has a remaining like shelf life of three or six months. But then, when you when you um, when you factor in logistics going naman to the to the uh, barangay health stations, pagdating doon, konti na lang yung shelf life na natitira dun sa sa mga supplies like sa nutrition supplies. So that that's really uh, one of the problems in terms of communication with stakeholders. Um, we know that, that there are various platforms are being utilized and this is something that that is um that is a positive sort of positive finding from the study in terms of nurturing care practices we we found that mothers are the primary caregiver followed by the father and then the grandparents in summer um it was it was raised that they prefer um, the caregivers to be female regardless of relation as they feel women are better um, at providing nurture uh, to, to, the, to the child. And this is important. This, this is an important information because when we want, for instance, to gather, um, we want to target people um, in, in information and education campaigns, it's, it would be important to, to include not only the parents, but also female members um, of the family. Thus, the study found also that parents have a profound understanding and definition of malnutrition. Uh, however, traditional beliefs um, exert strong um, influence on particular um, health and nutrition practices. With regards to pregnancy-related practices, it was found that some women do not immediately consult with health professionals. They tend to wait a bit longer, and their reason is that um, irregular yung kanilang monthly period. So one of them said, told me that, um, she waited like five, four or five months um, before she learned that she's pregnant. Because that that's how irregular um, the, the, the the monthly period is. So, in terms of of um, raising awareness uh, with this, I think it's very important that people in these areas really uh, have to be um, have to be sort of educated um, through various means, not just in schools, but also in a lot of of, of platforms. 
mothers show knowledge of practices uh, such as exclusive breastfeeding and signs of malnutrition. They are also aware of proper food uh, for their children um, dependent on age, and they are also knowledgeable of the importance of neurological stimulation through reading and playing. In terms of childbirth, there has been an active efforts by LGU to encourage and incentivize mothers to give birth to their babies in hospitals and health centers. And breastfeeding is a widely accepted and performed practice in both LGUs uh, that we examined based on responses of, of FGD participants and the time frame um, of, of breastfeeding um, is um, from six months to three years. We also found that parents caregivers approve of immunization for their children and they adhere to the immunization schedules prescribed to their children. And parents under study claim that they had enough knowledge and skills to provide quality care for their babies. There are also social and behavioral problems, um, however, within the family. And some parents are into gambling and vices, which can affect the nutrition and well being of the children. And then not all parents um, uh, avail of avail or cooperate in government efforts to enhance nurturing practices. And uh, it's it's a pity that um, Kung sino pa yung poor, uh, sila pa yung hindi nag cooperate and this is um, and this is particularly the case of non four piece um, parents. And um, interestingly, no, uh, the four piece um, families they're really very cooperative because yun yung ginagamit ng, ng mga ng mga implementers. So if you or if you not if you don't come to our um, like information dissemination, then you would lose your four piece um, um, grants. Um, and so, but then the problem is that if there are lots of poor um, families who are not included in the four Ps, uh, that's a problem kasi hindi sila nakakasama. So, um, the, the the reason of the non-four Ps is that, oh, hindi naman kami four Ps, bakit kami kasama? So, parang natatag yung, yung, yung four Ps as, as uh, sila lang yung pwedeng uh, mag-avail or sila lang yung pwedeng mag-participate. So we we also uh, of course found other contextual factors that are important. For instance, um, parents with insufficient incomes are unable to provide basic nutritional needs and other caring needs of their children, and this also limits time spent with children due to the extra work they must do to to make ends meet. In terms of geographic um, isolation or geographical constraints, it is really difficult to provide services and personal in in Gida areas. And what is um what is uh, problematic uh, when we when we uh, talk to people um, officials is that what what they did recently is that they target areas now based on number number of of children or number of malnourished children and not no longer about um um uh, a proportion or or prevalence of malnutrition that means that they are focusing on population areas and they may be uh they they they're now they may now overlook um the cases of those who are in in geographic um, isolated areas and of course um armed conflict in some areas uh, definitely is a significant barrier in the provision of health and nutrition services so yung mga midwives they are scared of going into these areas because may nababalitaan sila na bupugutan ng ulo. So, ganun po ka ano. So, yun yung, yun yung hirap uh, for, for the midwives and the other and the other um, health staff uh, to, to reach these areas because of the problem of armed conflict. Um, I think that would be for the summer uh, case. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tabuga, for your presentation of the uh, project overview and the findings of your study in Western uh, Samar. Our second presenter is uh, Connie Bayudin Dakuiku. He has a PhD in economics from Kyoto University. Dr. Dakuiku's research, uh, research areas include household, family, and gender issues, poverty analysis, and applied economic modeling. Prior to uh, rejoining uh, PIDS in 2017, she was assistant professor at the Department of Economics of Ateneo de Manila University. Dr. Dekoy will discuss about uh, what she and her team found in Northern Samar. Honey? Oh, yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. As she said, um, we are going to share with you the situation analysis that we did in Northern Summer, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, the help of Ms. Bahe and Ms. Um, Mariano uh, in this project. Next slide, please. So uh, here, um, I'm just going to give you uh, the key messages that 
it's going to be embedded in the discussion. So everything that I'm going to discuss is in the context of these key messages. Uh, one is that the, the, the first key message that we're putting forward is that uh, there is a timing of intervention is a critical element in implementing social programs. And uh, the second one would be not all municipalities are created equal. Um, and there are many elements here, but we're going to focus on the in terms of um, resources and in terms of the behavior and attitudes of uh, the LCEs. Uh, and then the third one would have something to do with with poverty, uh, the lack of economic opportunities, and geographical isolation. And then the fourth one has something to do with the supply side, and the fifth one has something to do with uh, the nurturing care practice. Uh, next slide, please. So for key, going into key message number one, uh, the timing of intervention being a critical element in implementing social programs, uh, Mamsel already gave an overview uh, on this one, but I think that it's uh, it, it bears repeating um, that the, really the timing of intervention is very critical, uh, and and this is um, uh, uh, it can we can see that uh, we we picked a. Um, uh, figure from the World Development Report in 2019, and this is uh, it, it really captures what it, it means because from the, uh, the 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 zero up to infancy, that's when we are learning more. That is when the brain, the infrastructure of the brain is being formed, and that is when we are able to absorb uh, information, maybe. Be, and, and and so it, it goes down as we grow older, uh, and conversely, um, there is um, a bigger bigger effort in terms of uh, the the need to uh, produce learning as we grow older, because uh, there's already a scientific evidence that says that the fastest synaptic growth and connection uh, happens in the first uh, 1,000 days, 270 days in the womb and 730 days in the first two years. So now if the timing is right, then the uh, social programs uh, can help in correcting inequalities stemming from circumstances at birth and social origins. Uh, what do we mean when we say this? Um, means that does not matter whether you belong to a poor family or whether you belong to a rich family. Each one of us will have an equal shot at uh, having a good life, having a good career, having a good education. If um, if the social uh, programs in place are able to uh, get their policies right, and if the timing of the intervention is, is right. So the timing is really critical. Uh, and there are already studies that says that uh, uh, interventions at the early stage of life is more effective than those administered later in life. Um, initial conditions at birth actually uh, it affects cognition, and if if it affects cognition, then uh, later later on it's going to affect uh, income uh, outcomes like income, labor force participation, a person's productivity, and there are already studies that that says that the initial conditions at birth, meaning how you are born, the, the, the your endowment when you were born. And the family background that you have. Now, is it important in explaining social outcomes like crime, social engagement, trust, and voting? Uh, next slide, please. So, um, uh, uh, at the center of the ECCDF1KD or the Early Childhood Care Development First 1000 Days is, is really this timing, and, and it seeks to provide um, ECCD system not just for the health and nutrition, but also for education uh, and psychosocial stimulation uh, and early education. Um, it's the ECCDF1KD is actually consistent with the ambition in uh, 2040 under the pillar of Pagbabago, and it is our articulated as well in the uh, PDP 2017 to 22, uh, where human development is, is uh, recognized to be a means to equalizing opportunities. Um, and at the same time, um, the ECC, the F1KD, if, if, if it's really successful, is it's going to help, uh, help achieve a lot of the SDG targets in ending hunger, uh, in ensuring good health and well-being, and, re and in reducing inequalities through the promotion of equal opportunities, among other things. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so all uh, all efforts are concerted towards this timing of intervention, and Mamsel already uh, mentioned about this PPAN. So the National Nutrition Con Council has crafted the PPAN, which is the country's framework plan on nutrition, um, and it has recognized that the issue in health and nutrition is uh, you know and it's multifaceted, and therefore there is a need for a complementation of programs, and so they crafted uh, programs which are nutrition. Nutrition specific uh, and nutrition sensitive. So, when we talk of nutrition specific programs, these are programs that are planned and designed to address immediate causes of malnutrition. This includes the micronutrient supplementation program, the feeding program, um, the program for addressing. Um, malnutrition and such. So when we talk of nutrition sensitive programs, these are programs that can be tweaked to produce nutritional outcomes. And there are targets, uh, for example, in specific groups or areas that, that are supposed to be beneficiaries of these interventions. Example of this would be um, uh, gulayan sa paaralan, backyard gardening, livelihood programs, etc. Um, next slide, please. Uh, at, the, at the multilateral uh, uh, level, uh, the UNICEF, WHO, and World Bank uh, came up with, uh, crafted uh, the nurturing care framework, and it's pretty much consistent with what the ECCDF 1KD. This is the roadmap um, the, of strategic actions that are aimed at the holistic child development. So, uh, being holistic, it's not just uh, 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 for sectors like health and nutrition, but also for education sector, uh, labor, finance, social protection, water and sanitation. Uh, and at the center of this nurturing care framework would be um, the household, the uh, uh, nurturing care, uh, which would takes place at the house, household level. But it recognizes that it requires strategic and synergistic action. And therefore, from the household to the national level, household community to the uh, national level, uh, they, they need to work together in order to uh, come up with solutions. Um, next slide, please. So just to show you some uh, uh, pro profile in the Philippines, uh, stunting remains a big issue. No? Based on the uh, FNRI 2018, uh, around 37% of children aged 12 to 23 are affected by stunting. And even our MMR or the maternal mortality rate uh, is still high compared to the SDG target. Uh, next slide, please. So just to show you some, uh, this is uh, uh, just to show you some information in terms of the field, uh, the the site, the study site that uh, we conducted the KIA and FGD in. It's Northern Samar, uh, and the stunting prevalence in Northern Samar is really high based on the WHO cutoff values, which is around 45.3. In fact, it uh, in Northern Samar is one of the provinces in East Eastern Visayas with the highest stunting prevalence in the region. Um, in terms of wasting prevalence, it's uh, also poor at 5.9 percent, based on again in the uh, based on the WHO cutoff values. Um, and we focused on Lopa de Vega and Catarman, and there is a substantial um, difference between the two. Lopa de Vega is a fourth class municipality, uh, 16 autobus. Uh, it's 22 barangays are Jida, and it has a very high uh, uh, stunting prevalence in 2017, but this is based on the Operation uh, Timbang administrative data that is uh, 41. And then Katarman is a first class municipality. This is the capital of Northern Samar. Um, 11, only 11 out of the 55 barangays are Jida, and based on its 2017 OPT, it has a stunting prevalence at 3. Um, so, but the, the, the despite that the, the, uh, we collected uh, uh, KII and FGT, we did that for Lope de Vega and Catarman, but uh, we also collected um, other um, uh, documents from uh, other municipalities. Next slide, please. So going into the key into key message number two, not all LGUs are created equal. Number one, uh, no, not equal in terms of leadership and governance because there are some barangays uh, that are more supportive of the ECCDF 1KD program, uh, and then the, their support is important precisely because there are some uh, funding that that comes. There are there, there are some uh, initiatives that need to be funded at the barangay level and, and some just don't care uh, but others are uh, more aware and more supportive 
Um, second, mayors, uh, both in Lopa de Vega and Catarman, they are supportive, although uh, the priority uh, really is the, uh, are, rather, are the infrastructure projects. So mostly the fund for, for the health and nutrition program is coming from the Economic Development Fund, uh, so around 20%. This 20% is then um, uh, divided into other um, uh, priorities and only 5% goes to the health and nutrition program. Uh, and then in, in particular, the, uh, the previous governor uh, in Northern Samar abolished the Provincial Nutrition Action Office. Uh, and this has uh, substantial implications in terms of uh, technical assistance provision, um, because now there's uh, uh, there's only one at the provincial level working, which is the PNAO, which is the Provincial Nutrition Action Officer, and all her staff were gone. So there's no, no the, she has no assistance in terms of, of, of providing help uh, at the municipal and barangay level. Uh, and at the same time, this is a substantial implication as well in the monitoring and uh, evaluation uh, of the program. Next slide, please. Uh, so, in terms of resources, not all LGUs are created equal again, because some uh, LGUs are less IRA dependent than others. So, you can see here we provided a sort of uh, a map uh, based on the total resources, and all almost all of them are purple. So, these are between 90 to 100 are coming, uh, or 90% 90 to 100% uh, of their uh, total resources are coming from external resources, meaning from IRA. Um, the only two uh, municipalities that do not have that kind of color would be Katarman and Allen. Katarman is around 75%. So it, in, in Katarman, um, they have... Um, uh, IGPs or income generating projects, uh, and they have economic enterprises as well. Uh, IGP, the, the, they have this facility that produces um, snacks that are uh, sna uh, snacks that are uh, vitamin fortified, and they, they use this uh, to target. Uh, uh, they they give this uh, snacks to um, uh, municipalities for their health and nutrition programs. And at the same time, they sell these snacks to uh, CSOs and uh, uh, institutions who'd like to, uh, to, to help uh, the program. And then they have economic enterprise, um, meron sila yung public market and terminal. And the good thing about this is that uh, everything goes to general fund. The collection com uh, uh, from this uh, enterprises and IGPs goes to general fund. And this, uh, the, it can therefore be used, uh, the LGU can therefore use to finance uh, priority programs. Next slide, please. So, because some municipalities have more funds uh, for health and nutrition than others, then the uh, uh, um, municipalities also vary in terms of the nutrition specific and nutrition uh, per, uh, nutrition specific and nutrition nutrition specific and nutrition sensitive programs than others. So, just to, to drive the point, uh, LDB Lope de Vega and San Jose they only have um, the five percent GAD and the LCPC under the Economic Development Fund a source for the health and nutrition programs, and you can see that their PPAs are mostly on training, nutrition classes, uh, mostly for information purposes. But if you look, take a look at, uh, for example, Katarman and Bobon, they have uh, various sources like GAD Fund, EDA, the Economic Development Fund, the General Fund, uh, and therefore they are able to not just uh, 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 implement nutrition-specific programs, but also nutrition-sensitive programs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here, oh, we, we just wanted to, to uh, again, drive the point that not all LGUs are equal uh, because we can see that the expendi expenditures of most northern summer uh, municipalities are heavily concentrated in general public services. So uh, to our left, to our left, the one with the purple, uh, we can see that most of them are, are spending their total resources in uh, general public services. General public services, these are um, services like uh, civil service, yung mga sweldo ng uh, civil servants, uh, yung sa um, peacekeeping, safety, yan, doon. Uh, and then if we, to our right, the green uh, graphs would be 
the uh, municipalities expenses in terms of uh, this is economic services. So you can see that again, Katarman is uh, uh, spending around 33% compared, for example, to other municipalities like Silvino Lobos, which is only at 5%, the others are 8%. So you can see this is substantial disparity there. Um, next slide, please. So here, what we're saying is that um, there is a need for um, uh, the uh, LGUs to develop income uh, IGPs and uh, uh, economic enterprises to increase funds. And they can do the, this by assessing what businesses have the potential to flourish in the local context. Uh, first is to identify the types of assistance that can be provided. So for example, uh, do, do they need provision? Uh, uh, do they need provision uh, of training, development of skills, facilitation of loans, and linking up with potential partners such as CSOs and social enterprises? There is also the, uh, a need to um, probably they can explore the use of the 2022 uh, increase in the IRA to strengthen factors that can help in nutrition related issues. Uh, so, uh, one thing that they can do here is to create plantilla positions to nutrition personnel because. Um, we found out that um, the M now or the Municipal Nutrition Action Officer and the P now, which is the Provincial Nutrition Action Officer, they are currently designated officers. So that means that they have to do things other than the, the other than the implementation, overseeing the implementation of health and nutrition uh, programs, and and you know being able to give them this um, plenty plenty of position, they'd be able to focus more. Um, in terms of monitoring, uh, in terms of um, implementation. Next slide, please. So in terms of key message number three, we say here that poverty and the lack of economic opportunities and geographical isolation adversely affect health and nutrition outcomes. Um, and then, then we provided here the map for uh, poverty based on the small area estimates in 2015. Um, and the, and the, uh, the thing here is that if you look at Silvino Lobos, which has the highest poverty incidence, 46% uh, of its total workforce are in elementary occupation. So these are uh, people who are wor working using basic and um, uh, basic tools, essentially. And then 44% uh, are in a AFR, or Agriculture, Fishery, and Resources. Um, and we all know that AFR is uh, always affected by fluctuation in prices and, and by the vagaries of weather. So uh, it, it, there's an issue of stability of income here. Um, and if you take a look at Katarman, Katarman is the again as we have said, the, uh, Katarman. I can I can see that. I can see the slide. Katarman, uh, Katarman here is uh, the they, it it has very low uh, uh, stunting prevalence, but and then at the same time, uh, the. It has varied uh, occupation groups, like for example, 21% are in uh, uh, are in AFR, 21 are managers. So there's a there's substantial variation. And then in terms of being a JIDA, um, uh, Katarman only has around 20, uh, around 21%. Uh, let me just check because I can't see uh, from the screen the numbers. Uh, 20% uh, for Katarman, and then Lope de Vega around 73%, and Silvino Lobos that has a, a very high poverty incidence uh, is actually a GIDO municipality. Next slide, please. So uh, for keep it, uh, again, uh, going into the key, key message number three, uh, the poverty is really very important here because it can influence feeding a lot of things. It can influence uh, feeding practices of infants and young children. So on the ground, uh, we we found out that children are eating junk foods with rice precisely because they, uh, their parents have no money to to um, to keep children uh, in terms of baon. Um, the RUTFs are sh shared uh, with everyone in the household when in fact it should be on it, it should be only used for a child. Um, and then the exclusive breastfeeding is also affected by mother's nutrition. Um, uh, poverty can also influence the attitudes of caregivers. And we have to uh, keep in mind that, you know, uh, for most of these people, uh, poverty has become a way of life. Uh, they are, they, they have, uh, they are poor now, but uh, 
probably their parents are poor and even their four uh, fathers are poor. So, so the, the idea here is that um, it, the poverty can, uh, uh, you know, can influence mindset. No, uh, so in terms of there's a problem of hygiene, there's a problem of laziness, uh, there's a problem of information fatigue, uh, in the sense that uh, we're always uh, uh, from in the ground. The, the people were saying that um, uh, we're always hearing this uh, this uh, uh, information, but nothing happened. So why why are we going to listen? So uh, there there's there are a lot of, of, of uh, things that uh, come out when when we talk of uh, poverty and, and at the same time exclusive breastfeeding is also affected uh, by the mother's desire to go out and work and so what we're saying here is that um, there is a need uh, to ensure that poor uh, poor families are uh, four piece uh, beneficiaries uh, and LGU has to take the lead here because they need to ensure that their constituents are advised of the conduct of the Lista Hanan. Um, the Lista Hanan is the national household targeting system for poverty reduction and is the one that is used uh, by DSWD to identify uh, and select uh, four piece beneficiaries. So LGUs uh, need to ensure, uh, wait, uh, there's a message that locks, wait, uh, okay. Um, Ensure that live births are recorded at the local registry, and then the LGUs need to help uh, families in going through the process of the lead registration. And this is very important. This this documents very important because without this, they won't be able to get into the program. Uh, and the second thing that we want to emphasize here is that there is a need to craft appropriate uh, livelihood assistance programs and strengthen the monitoring of such. Um, there's another message that's blocking. Uh, I will just. Uh, so there is a need to address mismatch, uh, understand the problems and challenges. Uh, in fact, people were saying that you know uh, LGUs and people who are implementing these programs they need to go to the community and immerse, uh, and so that they'd be able to understand what we, what the community really need. So in order to ensure ensure buy in, um, there's another message I need to, I can't see because I can I could not see. Uh, uh, to ensure buy-in, there is a need to consult with the community, it, and it's going to foster some sense of ownership of the projects. Um, address sustainability issues as well, because the the, the thing is, uh, people are saying that oh, they just gave us seedlings and they just gave us uh, um, uh, um, li livestock or, or pigs or hogs for raising, but th then again, they did not monitor what happened then. Did, did it turn, did, did, did they um, sell it? Did it turn into something more, like uh, something more profitable? So there's no such thing that's uh, in place. Um, so another uh, another thing that we're saying here is that there, there is a need to explore tie-ups with social enterprises. Um, social enterprises, these are um, uh, businesses that uh, puts the community at the center of their operation, and and they are more aware and highly evolved in terms of, um, uh, in terms of doing their business. So in, they they employ poor people, uh, or or women, or people with issues, the, or uh, victims of certain issues. Uh, wait, uh, there's another message I need to because I could not see. Sorry. Um, uh, right. So. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, next slide, please. So here, uh, key message number four, uh, there are existing and emerging issues uh, or concerns in the supply side as well. Uh, one issue is the related to uh, 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 frontline workers, the BNS, the Barangay Nutrition Scholars, uh, and uh, Barangay Health Workers. Uh, one is that um, they sometimes complain of inadequate honorarium. And again, this uh, the 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 key message number two figures here because uh, sometimes it depends on the LGU. Sometimes uh, they will get 500, sometimes they get 1,250, sometimes they get five, uh, 1,500. Um, and then there's an excessive workload uh, because the ideal, uh, ideal, this is what we get from the ground, ideal is only one BHW or Barangay Health Workers for every 20 households, but this really, really never happened. This never happens. It, it goes way more than, uh, so, and therefore there is an excessive workload. And the third one would be uh, hiring and firing is LCE's discretion. 
Uh, and therefore, uh, there is a very high turnover among these frontline workers. Uh, and then and the problem here is that it hampers the continuity of the F1KD implementation. You're going to train again because the people that uh, replace the other, the, the past uh, uh, frontline workers uh, do not know how to do, do the measurement, stuff like that. Uh, and so there are a number of barangays that do not have uh, BNSs. And see, this hampers actually really the, uh, the implementation of uh, uh, yeah, the F1KD program. Uh, second is that uh, there there are also issues uh, flagged by uh, people, uh, uh, mothers, parents, uh, caregivers, uh, in terms of the behavior of the RH personnel. So sometimes they're saying, oh, they're unsympathetic, they're dismissive. And even in the queuing system in the RH, you can be based uh, on friendship association with some health workers. There, there are also issues on supply, so in, in, uh, inadequate uh, perisulfate uh, tablet with folic acid, which is important in, in uh, for pregnant women. Um, issue also in transportation, safety and security, especially for the, the barangays and armed con conflicts. So most of these areas do not have health centers. And then and, and so you can just imagine what's uh, happening there. Um, and then there are also emerging needs and issues. Uh, for example, the M nows and P nows are uh, saying that uh, they don't have um, capacity yet in terms of identifying, um, in terms of dealing rather dealing with parents and caregivers that have mental health problems. Um, there's also an increasing prevalence of teenage pregnancy, especially in Katarman, and obesity and TB in young children. Uh, and at the same time, they, they, there's a difficulty in terms of identifying malnourished pregnant mothers and nutritionally, nutritionally at risk uh, women. Um, next slide, please. And then, so therefore, here what we're saying is that there's really a need to strengthen the human resources working on nutrition, uh, and and to provide training not on, on a, and not only in the technical skills but also in communication and advocacy strategy, because they need to demonstrate competence and, and so that uh, they will be trusted more by the parents and caregivers. So they need technical skills, data collection. Uh, identification of nutritionally at risk women and communication uh, skills as well. Uh, and, and, and secondly, there is a need to really improve the delivery of health and nutrition uh, PPAs, uh, pro programs, projects, and uh, activities, uh, so, uh, especially in GDA areas. Uh, so increase honorarium and improve logistics. Next, next slide, please. The last one. Here, key message number five uh, has something to do with uh, caregiving practices. And uh, here, uh, mothers and caregivers, they know already what to do, but there are some challenges. So, for example, uh, they know they, they know a lot about health and nutrition, so they know where to seek uh, advice from. They are aware of the signs of malnutrition. They are aware of the symptoms of pregnancy, and they are aware of the red flags. Um, and so, in terms of health and nutrition, they are okay. In terms of security and safety, they are also aware of everything, of what, what, what expectant and lactating mothers should do and should not do, should not eat, should not drink, um, they are all aware of that. The only thing that uh, was um, uh, brought uh, into our attention was in the area of learning. Um, only a few of the mothers or caregivers are aware of the importance of neurological stimulation. So th this is the one that where even in the womb, um, parents uh, need to uh, to read to children, to, to talk to the inf uh, unborn, uh, to play music to the unborn, and very few uh, read the kids and play music. And so what we're saying here is that, uh, again, strengthen the promotion of neurolog neuro neurological um, uh, stimulation of the unborn, infants, and young children. So this can be highlighted in mother's classes, uh, family development sessions, doctor's consultation, home visits, and even in the uh, crafting and design of the IEC materials. Uh, and lastly, there is a need to rethink strategies for communicating health and nutrition advocacy for behavior change. Uh, uh, earlier, I was pointing uh, out that there's an information fatigue already among uh, parents and caregivers. Um, and then, so uh, we were thinking that maybe if, if the, there's some way to localize the IEC materials, because from what we heard from the ground, the IEC materials are coming from the NN NNC, from the national level. Uh, and therefore, um, if uh, maybe localize the IEC materials, uh, it can uh, inspire people by, by putting a face of success, uh, a, a face on success stories 
stories. So you use local stories that are closer to home and being closer to home, it's relatable. And, and so people might be able to relate more uh, to the um, advocacy and communication strategy. Uh, lastly, uh, use catchy and easy to remember lines, Ugot lines formed in the dialect uh, in order to um, strengthen uh, communication uh, strategies. Uh, I think that's it for me. I turn over the floor to Sheila. Thank you very much, Dr. Takuikoi, for your uh, thought-provoking findings and uh, insights. Um, for our last, uh, for our third and last presenter, we have uh, Michael Abrigo. Dr. Abrigo's research areas are on um, population, health and nutrition, and policy issues. Prior to his return to the Philippines, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the East West Center in Honolulu, and he obtained his PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So, uh, Dr. Abrigo will tell us what he and his team found in Sambuanga del Norte. Mike? Thank you so much, Sheila. Uh, this is a work that I did with our colleague, uh, Zandra Tam. So, uh, thank you, uh, Zandra. Um, but the good thing with being the last presenter is uh, over with, with the same topic is that you can gloss over some of the topics and just focus on, on some of the details that are, I guess, uh, distinct to, to San Juan del Norte. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have uh, we did a similar uh, similar design as the other uh, sites. So we looked at uh, different data for for the whole province. So we looked at um, administrative data from different government agencies, national surveys and censuses, and also field work uh, in two sites, uh, Sindang and Leon Postigo. We talked with program managers, frontline workers, uh, child caregivers, and we administered a checklist of the different uh, local governments in, in that province. Next slide, please. So just provide a background of uh, where Sambuanga del Norte is and what's in Sambuanga del Norte. Next slide, please. Uh, Sambuanga del Norte is a relatively new province. It has 25 municipalities and two cities. Uh, and one of the key features of Sambuanga del Norte is that 97% of their land area is strongly is composed of strongly sloping, sloping to very steep hills and mountains. So less than 3% of their land is suitable for agriculture. However, they have these uh, large, uh, very long coastline facing uh, the Sulu Sea. Um, with 97% of their um, their land area being uh, steep hills and mountains, it's not surprising that in 2017, based on the Department of Health uh, report, 596 uh, barangays out of 691 in the province are classified as Gidas. Next slide, please. So they have a relatively small population of 1 million. A third of these population, though, is concentrated in just three LGUs, uh, mainly those who are richer, uh, bigger LGUs. They have a young population uh, with 22, uh, with the median age at 22. Uh, they have a high literacy rate at 95% among those aged uh, 15 and older. Next slide, please. In terms of child nutrition and health status, uh, if you compare them with the Philippines and the rest of Sambuanga Peninsula, they have a relatively um, high uh, malnutrition prevalence among those uh, below five years old. So they have higher proportion of children who are underweight, stunted, and wasted. But in terms of deaths per live births, they have relatively low, uh, low prevalence. Uh, although we are not sure if this is because of reporting issues, but in the official reports, they have lower uh, deaths per thousand live births. Next slide, please. So based on the, uh, so here we're trying to compare the um, OPT, the Operation Timbang, which is an administrative data and national nutrition survey estimates for the whole province, which is the gray area, and the OPT for the different uh, municipalities. And what's apparent here is that uh, the estimates, the statistics from the administrative data is comparably lower to the, to the somehow uh, better data from the National Nutrition Survey. But what is also apparent from this um, from this picture is a large disparity in, in estimates in undernutrition uh, using different measures uh, in the different municipalities, cities of Sambuanga del Norte. Next slide, please. 
So going now to the results of our FGD and, uh, and other results. Next slide, please. So like any other LG in the Philippines, they have a local nutrition action officers, which effectively serves as the secretary of, of the local nutrition committees. Often, like in other uh, case sites, these positions are designated to the health officer or the social welfare and development officer, the population officer, if they have that, if they have those. So many times these are doctors, nurses, midwives, although these people have their own uh, designations, they, they have their uh, primary designation and being an L now, is just an added designation that which sometimes they do or sometimes not really. So in terms of priority, priority setting, uh, like in other uh, sites, uh, these are executive-led. So kung ano yung sinabi ng mayor, ano yung sinabi ng, ng provincial governor, ito yung gagawin nila, and they support that. And at the time of the FGDs, uh, uh, we asked, and there's, they were saying that uh, the focus was on infrastructure in line with the national BBB program. Uh, they've mentioned that some program managers have been consulted when they are doing and they are setting the priorities for the local government. Uh, and sometimes it appears that uh, if at all, if they were asked, the frontline workers, yung ating mga barangay health workers, yung ating mga uh, um, health officers, nutrition officers, uh, they appear to have a very minor role in, in setting this priority for the local government. Next slide, please. So, um, we have local nutrition plans, and this is part of the 33 legally mandated local uh, lo local uh, plans that should be developed by any LGU. And there is a pro forma uh, National Nutrition Council about local nutrition plans. Uh, but and, and we we compare the nutrition action plans that from the different municipalities as among the north. And what we found is that. Uh, there is a wide variation in quality and availability, even availability of local nutrition plans. There are uh, municipalities that are or isang sheet lang yung local, local nutrition action plan, which is just a uh, budget. So there is suggested format um, uh, NNC, but many do not conform to these formats. Uh, but among those that conform to the format, it appears that the local nutrition committees have a robust understanding of the underlying causes of malnutrition. So they understand that this is because of you know, access to resources, issues, so mainly household community issues. However, in some mga local nutrition action plans, it appears that uh, rarely na may mention yung mga issues about government capacity or government resources or the lack of it to be able to respond to these, uh, to respond to the issues on nutrition. Uh, we also did a checklist. Uh, of ano ba yung kasama dun sa mga local nutrition action plans and the, because in the local nutrition action plans they have these issues and then ano yung gagawin natin and how would we place this, uh, these actions and for the most part yung mga interventions na common is yung nutrition education, feeding, food production, livelihood program, nutrition month celebration. Ito yung nutrition month celebration na yung constant yan. Uh, what we noticed though is that uh, we Kasi itong local nutrition plan, that should be, uh, this is a sectoral plan. And, and ideally, you would want that to be part, at least ideas, part of the comprehensive development plan uh, para ma-access mo yung local development fund. But for the most part, at least for the, for the LNAPs and the CDPs that we've compared, many of the LNAPs are not really ano ba, linked to the CDPs, which for us is a lost opportunity. Kasi kung hindi nakalink yung LNAP mo sa CDP, then you cannot access this uh, local development fund, which is a loss opportunity sana to, to finance uh, the local nutrition plans. Next slide, please. So in terms of service delivery, next slide. Uh, the ECCD uh, and the F1KD law has uh, have these different mandated services and nakalista dun sa batas na very specific. And what we did was to have this checklist and ask the local government units, do you have these services? So, so many, are, many of these services are government provided as part of the, of the usual LGU programs for maternal child health and nutrition, ECCD and family planning. So these are vertical programs. Uh, when we say vertical programs, 
is really in program in maternal child health and nutrition, yung ECCD, yung family planning, and they are not really integrated. And ideally, in, in the first 1,000 days, the framework, you would want the services na even if they are standalone, uh, somehow, nakalink sila sa isa't isa para nasusundan mo yung bata as the child develops. Uh, when we compared uh, those, um, the checklists that we got from the, from the LGUs, ito yung mga common na hindi available. So one is those services na not necessarily facility-based. So pag mga yung services is facility-based, check yung mga LGUs dyan, madaling ibigay. So like nutrition counseling, hindi yung maraming mga LGUs ang nagsabi na wala silang ganun. So organizing breastfeeding use because this, this is in the community, support for home, kitchen, garden. So nasa labas siya ng opisina. So usually yan yung mga sinasabi nila. Another is that uh, if the service require inter-office or agency coordination, so, halimbawa, um, yung, matern yung health office, yung RHU, at yung agriculture office, pag meron nang kailangan ganung uh, coordination, dun na medyo wala na yung ganung services sa LGU. So, like yung enrollment sa social health insurance, so from RHU to PhilHealth. Availability of lactation breaks in workplace. So, um, kasama na dyan yung, yung uh, sa employment. So, also, mga wala din is on if it's psychosocial in nature, so yung counseling and psychosocial support na in the F1KD law, this is provided in different stages, especially sa adolescence at sa living in stress. And finally, pag-related to oral care. And this is not an, just an issue about uh, ECCD F1KD, but uh, oral care in general, uh, services provided in the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of identification of beneficiaries, uh, usually mga program managers, they rely heavily on the interpersonal interaction of the frontline workers uh, with the household. When we say frontline workers, ito yung mga barangay nutrition scholar, barangay health workers, kasi yung barangay health workers and BNS, yung iba nga meron silang barangay population officers, uh, they have these uh, parang area na sila yung mayroong uh, toka, toka nila. So kilala nila yung mga taong nandun. And usually, doon naman sila nakatira. So, alam nila kung sino yung bata, sino yung buntis, uh, sino yung mapayat, sino yung at risk. So, so nakarelay talaga, very reliant to program sa frontline workers. Next slide, please. Uh, when we were in Sabuanga del Norte last year, what, what, we were happy with the innovations uh, that the local governments has introduced. So, um, Meron yung OPT, yung Operation Team Ban, that is part of a regular program of LGUs na mandated from by NNC. But they also have these household census. So meron silang sariling census to profile yung needs ng mga, mga constituents nila. So para alam nila kung sila nakatira sa ganitong bahay, ilang taon, kung merong sakit o kung merong buntis. They also, have, they also introduced an LGU caravan. This is a one-stop shop for LGU services. So ang idea, uh, clusters of barangay uh, for this day, itong mga services natin, so yung uh, census, yung registration ng birth, yung registration ng businesses, uh, yung RHU, me medical dental, lahat tayo sabay-sabay tayo, pupunta tayo sa isang barangay. And ang goal nila is every month, makupuntahan nila yung buong, buong bayan nila, kung bayan yan. And another is on food production. Uh, isang come on ng provincial government ay meron silang uh, meron silang bakahan, a uh, dairy farm. Tapos yung dairy na kukuha nila, ginagawa nilang ice candy. Although uh, medyo matinis yung ice candy nila, so hindi ko siya na sure na very very nutritious siya. Pero yung ice candy is a come on to pe for people na pumunta pag meron silang mga meetings. Yung pupunta raw sila sa mga caravans, may dila silang ice candy para maraming tao pumunta. At least for the ice candy and for the other services. Um, meron din sila during that time, uh, meron silang plan na gumawa ng isang parang factory for food supplements or yung mga, ano, uh, yung mga chips na nutritious. So, there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, ito yung mga challenges naman na, na nakita namin when we were there. So, for the program managers and frontline workers, uh, they said that they had difficulty convincing households to participate. Uh, halimbawa, meron silang program uh, the feeding program, but this is a one-off thing. So my feeding program, pupunta sila doon, 
Uh, pero kaka- hindi pupunta yung mga households. Kasi nasabi nila, uh, kasi tamad daw, or baka nahihiya, mga ganong issues. Another issue na ni-raise nila is that uh, minsan kasi merong age group lang yung, gusto, yung pwede doon sa feeding program. Pero kung isa yung batang pwede, uh, isa yung batang eligible, pero lima yung anak nila, imbis na pumunta yung isa, hindi nila napapapapuntahin kasi hindi naman kasama yung iba nilang mga anak. Uh, there is also issue about transportation and communication facilities in one area. I mentioned that on a, on a good day, maaraw, uh, it takes about two hours to go to, to this site. Pero kung umulan na, so mga eight hours siya. So just imagine kung buntis ka in that, in that area, kailangan mo meron kang medical emergency and you have to go uh, to a health facility. So talagang issue siya. Uh, in terms of communication naman, um, yung usual reporting nila sa RHU, yung mga frontline workers usually uh, is done on a Friday. So, uh, meron mga areas na dead spot dun sa, dun sa area. So, what they do is go down from uh, usually mga mountainous regions. To. So, pupunta sila sa mga may daanan para lang makapag-text. And that takes a lot of time. Uh, in terms of caregivers naman, uh, general, yung mga caregivers naman, ang sinasabi nila, generally, wala naman daw silang problem with access to government services. So kung kailangan nilang magpa sa facility, they can, they can easily go. Uh, one potential, although there is this uh, quality issue that they've raised, na medyo masusungit daw yung mga frontline workers. So minsan daw uh, naninigaw, may meron silang ganun. Although hindi naman siya, siyempre lahat. Meron lang sinasabi na meron mga ganun nangyari. Also, uh, they've mentioned uh, hard quotas, na mentioned din to sa ibang site. Uh, hard quotas or schedule that which may dissuade uh, further access dun sa ibang mga namay. For instance, uh, halimbawa, Tuesday ang araw ng buntis. Kasi hindi ka ina- galing ka pa sa bundok, araw ng buntis. Pwede mo sa, sa facility hapon na, sarado na, pasara na, hindi ka na maahutan. Although merong mga, kami mga pinuntahan, na ina-extend naman yung hours nila para ma-accommodate yung mga, yung mga patas na galing sa malalayo. Pero merong mga sites naman na talagang hard sila na pag ganitong oras sa alas 5, sarado, sarado na talaga. And that is waits people to go to facilities. Parang nadadala ba? Ganun yung, yung pagkakasabi. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of financing, next slide. Uh, when we look at the different uh, LGUs in, in the province, mataas yung reliance nila on the internal revenue allotment. And, and to some extent, this is uh, because yung endowment nila on land. So, okay. So, syempre, kung nakarelate sila, kung nakarelate sila sa ira, magkano lang yun, hindi sila nakapag, uh, nakapag-raise sa sarili ng revenues. This affects the resources that's available for them, for the services na bibigay nila. So, uh, this does not affect just health, pero yung iba pa mga services, so pati agriculture, even public works. So, dun sa mga iba naming mga LGs na pinuntahan, they've mentioned that they leverage on ties with the national agencies. Yung mga iba, uh, dun po sumusulat sa Pawisma, tumutuloy sa DPWH, national, para makahingi ng tulong for, for the infra projects that they want, or that they need for their uh, LGU. Next slide, please. So, Ito yung sinasabi ko kanina na pag-limited yung income ng LGU mo, uh, limited din siyempre yung kaya mong ibigay na servisyo. And this is not unique to ECCD, first 1,000 days program. So, and what we found here, at least in this graph, is that when you expand yung LGU income, nakita naman natin yung nag expand din yung mga services. So, so, tumataas din naman yung binibigay din ng pera for ECCD F1 daily. Next slide. Uh, ito yung medyo nakakalungkot kasi uh, compared yung stunting prevalence sa municipality LGU to their population health nutrition expenditure per capita. And what we found is that yung mga actually matataas ang matataas ang malnutrition rate, sila yung mabababa, mabababa ang uh, ini-invest sa population health and nutrition which could be, sy- syempre, a factor of the resources as available to them. So, may, may, hindi siya causal, but meron ganong correlation. Next slide. Uh, in terms of physical and human resource, uh, next slide. Pati yung sinasabi ni Connie kanina na not all LGUs are created, not LG, all L- LGUs are not created equal. So, some LGUs are more fortunate than others. So, 
meron mga resources because of the because of meron mga LGs na because of the resources that's available to them uh, although gusto nilang mag-hire they cannot hire because of the PS cap so ito lang yung pera natin kaya hanggang ganito lang kadami yung kaya natin hire so, it directly affects yung workload ng mga frontline workers na kung konti lang yung kaya kong i-hire isang doktor lang yung kaya kong i-hire di isang doktor pa sa lahat and again uh, this issue is not unique to the health sector but do sa buong LGU kasi kung minsan gusto nila lang engineer hindi rin sila makapag-hire kasi may PS cap so to a large extent, they, they rely on HH on the deployment program at the Department of Health. Although maraming program managers are they are somewhat concerned with the sustainability. Kasi isip nila papaano pag wala na tong deployment program ng uh, Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So uh, in terms of human resource, community volunteers are important. So ito yung mga barangay nutrition scholars, barangay health workers, these are really important because they perform critical frontline services. So they do the monitoring, they do the promotion, sometimes they provide the service. Uh, however, they do not enjoy the same level of benefits and compensation, security of tenure. Uh, oh, kahit na parang full-time, sabi volunteer, pero full-time naman yung trabaho nila. Uh, in one area, as much as 150 young children and 110 pregnant women ang cargo ng isang uh, frontline worker. And they get only between 350 to 1,200, depending kung gano'ng ka-generous yung LJU, uh, per month. So, and generally, they are the pleasure of their local services, a local executive. Uh, so, it affects the supply ng mga trained, capacitated frontline workers natin. Next slide. Uh, ito, this is a kwento ng resources kung meron barangay health work, barangay uh, health station that means na kaya nilang mas, mas madali na access yung mga resources next slide um, you know the LG used uh, maybe because of the resources that they have uh, they rely heavily on the supplies from the national government so for instance you know vaccines you know supplement they get this from the national governments although they also receive from uh, from community organizations NGOs so uh, one issue when we were there is that there was a uh, miscommunication between the national government and the NGOs because sabi nila promise daw yung national government pero walang dumating hindi nila nilagay sa budget nila kasi nag promise daw yung national government tapos ganun so parang may miscommunication which is an important issue uh, in case of stop out Nung nandun kami, ang issue was uh, vaccines. Uh, meron mga region, uh, well, halos lahat nung, nung nakausap namin ng mga LGUs, pag walang vaccine or walang supply, uh, to the extent na kaya nilang uh, kumuha, mag-leverage dun sa mga friends nila from the other sectors, kumukuha sila. Pero kung wala nang stop, uh, tigil. Tigil ang ating programa. Walang, walang vaccination, walang food supplementation. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of bright spot, um, they have these in some um, LGUs, they have these peer to peer learning among frontline workers, although this is there. Uh, one issue with frontline workers is that uh, they so, they're supposed to be capacitated, but hindi lahat to be given a chance uh, to go to trainings. Merong mga, mga frontline workers, na three years ng frontline workers, pero wala pang training. And to some extent, yung peer to peer, to peer, to peer learning uh, bridges that gap. Uh, but despite these challenges, uh, yung training, yung malit, yung malit yung nakukuha nilang pera from the government, yung mga LGU personnel, uh, they said that they're generally fulfilled with, with their work and are looking forward to continue working the same position uh, in the near future. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of information and communication, next slide. Uh, so they use, when they do these plans, when they do the programs, Yung mga managers have different information sources, so OPT. Uh, although yung mga issues yung OPT, yung measurement tools na ginagamit, hindi, merong mga nagsabi na hindi properly calibrated. Na pag kumuha ka ng timbangan, pag sinabi mo 1 kilo, minsan hindi siya 1 kilo. Or minsan um, ad hoc yung mga measuring, measuring tape ang ginagamit instead of, the, instead of the usual na calibrated na stick or yung mga weighing scale. Uh, there was also... Um, an issue, o, paano ba binimeasure yung baby? Halimbawa, baby. 
nakatayo ba siya o nakahiga pag dimension? Pag nakahiga, merong, merong correction na ina-add. Uh, 7 centimeters ba? 0.7 inches? 0.7 inches or 7 inches? Parang ganun. And they also have difficulty calculating standardized scores to calculate ilang ba yung uh, under, undernourished na mga bata. Next slide. Uh, one issue that we found is that ito is for the OPT. Kinumpare namin yung ilang bata ba yung napuntahan nila compared sa ilang yung batang nandun based sa census. And what we found out is that meron mga areas na, na smash, parang a little over 10% lang yung napuntahan nila mga bata. Tapos meron mga areas naman na 15 times yung mga batang nandun dapat yung pinuntahan nila. So saan yung galing yung 14 times na mga batang minesure nila? So which, which uh, parang question yung credibility, yung validity ng data na, na ginagamit. Next slide. Okay, next slide please. So very critical yung frontline workers sa dissemination ng information. Uh, because according to the parents and the caregivers, itong mga frontline workers natin, DNSBWs, they are, uh, they are the key source of trusted information, sabi mga parents at mga caregivers. Uh, other dissemination forms na ginagamit ng mga LGUs include yung traditional media, yung meron sila mga kapihan, guestings, so yung mass media natin. Meron sila mga information blast through barangay captain, so yung mga parang merong lumiikot yung barangay tapos nakasakay sa jeep na merong uh, stereo. Uh, walang masyadong social media, which is surprising at this, uh, in these times. Uh, walang masyadong gumagamit ng social media. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, one issue with the social media, though, is syempre, mahina yung sintetya. Siguro gano'n. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of nurturing care practices, uh, among FGD participants, uh, generally, meron silang good knowledge of nurturing care practices at home. So, alam nila yung ideal timing of antenatal care, uh, optimal breastfeeding duration, sabi na six months, uh, child immunization schedule, complementary feeding practices, pag tinanong mo yung mga nanay, alam nila yan. Pati tatay, alam nila. So yung mga sources of information, mga magulang, mga caregivers, so usually yung parents nila, health workers, social media, and they are very appreciative of the information that they get from the frontline workers. Next slide, please. However, syempre, iba naman yung alam mo sa ginagawa. So yung Knowledge does not necessarily equate to the actual practice or behavior of the caregivers. So, yung mga more experienced, like yung mga yung mga nanay, yung mga marami ng anak, uh, they said that they are more confident with the knowledge and practices na ginagawa nila. So, some reported engaging child through playing and storytelling, pero marami nang kasabi na hindi na nagagawa yung mga marami dun sa mga nasa listahan ng ECCD uh, law at F1KD law. Uh, dahil sa housework, o meron silang mga ibang mga bagay na kailangan ko in life. Marami pa silang ibang anak. O meron silang kalabaw na kailangan puntahan. Mga, mga ganong issues. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So, uh, like in many places in the Philippines, mothers are usually the child givers, uh, but we found out that fathers and others take over pag yung nanay kailangan magtrabaho. So, meron, which is the usual case. So, Yung mga iba, uh, sabi nila, kaya nung hindi sinabi, iniiwan mo nila anak nila na walang kasama. So may nagsabi na meron mga ganun, pero kung importante, importante lang, uh, they agree na pag iniwan mo yung bata, pwede ma-accidente. Next slide. At yung mga challenges na ni-raise nila during the FGDs. So one is that their income may be insufficient to provide the best quality care. Na even if they have these uh, knowledge about the best practices, hindi nila, hindi nila magawa sa totoong buhay kasi wala naman silang resources. Uh, in terms of a delay in, in, in the antenatal care, usual na siya sinasabi, walang pera, nahihiya, hindi sigurado. Kaya sinabihan siya ng nanay niya na huwag na pumunta, so kumadol na pumunta. Sumunod naman sa nanay. Next slide, please. Uh, ito na yung mga approximal, uh, mga distal uh, measures. So, meron tayong mga kailangan gawin, yung mga proximal measures na relate sa health, but in terms of the more distal, medyo malayo na, uh, one, one issue is the access of households to resources. And isang issue is yung food prices. And when we look at prices sa uh, Philippines, sa Buwaga del Norte, uh, sa Buwaga Pinisong and sa Buwaga del Norte, generally more expensive yung presyo ng mga pagkain sa Sambuang del Norte. Next slide. 
uh, in terms of employment, uh, similar naman siya sa, sa national, uh, national rates, uh, but largely 36 percent, uh, a third is in agriculture, 27 percent are low skilled. Next, next slide. Uh, ito rin ay isang important issue is a uh, poverty poverty incidence. Um, over the past what 15 years uh, or 10 years, one decade, there's a declining poverty rate uh, in Sabuanga del Norte. So that's a win. However, it remains high. Uh, in 2015, uh, the area, small area estimates half of all of Sabuanga del Norte, so half of all Sabuanga del Norte population is below uh, poverty level. And in some areas, as much as two thirds of, of individuals are poor. Next slide. And siempre, uh, when we correlate this with the uh, undernutrition prevalence in those areas, pag mas mataas yung poverty rate, uh, more likely mas mataas din yung undernutrition rate. Next slide. So, an issue is, ano mangyayari ngayon kung kung nag-improve yung, kung bumaba yung presyo ng halimbawa pagkain, is that, is that the solution? Ang sagot eh, syempre, it depends. Kasi one-third lang naman nung mga nasa sa mga del norte, nasa agriculture. Many of them are actually not in agriculture. So pag bumaba yung presyo ng pagkain, okay yung two-thirds, pero pag yung one-third na nasa agriculture, hindi masyado. Kasi liliit yung kita nila. Which is a difficult balancing act uh, for, for anyone. Next slide. Uh, ito na, papahuli na to, environmental health, uh, in terms of drinking water, sa, sa mga del norte, medyo detailed yung data natin, uh, but this is the best available. In 2010, uh, relatively, they have poor conditions relative to the country or the region. Only one in five households have own, own pipe to water. About 10% use unimproved water sources. So ito yung mga open wells, or yung mga unprotected na mga streams. Next slide. Uh, in terms of toilet facility, 12% uh, ang walang toilet facility in 2010. About a third, uh, with about a third of households have an improved uh, toilet facility, which is much higher compared to the rest of the Philippines. Next slide. Um, hand washing practices very important to ngayon sa panahon ng COVID. Uh, marami naman ang gumagamit. This is from the National Demographic and Health Survey. So Largely with soap and water, 84%, pero more than 10% yung water lang ginagamit, walang soap, or some with no water or soap. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Um, I turn you over to Al for the recommendations. Thank you so much. Al, please, for the recommendations. Thank you, Mike, um, and thank you, Connie, for the present for their presentations. Okay, let me just check my. Okay, so um, for our recommendations for policy leadership and governance, there's a greater need for advocacy for F1KD or first 1,000 days of efforts to rise in LGU priorities, and of course, using hard evidence um, to show this is very essential. And there's a need for more conscious effort for joint planning and targeting and activities and inputs linked to desired outcomes and joint accountability. So for the leadership and on policy and governance aspect, there's really a need for the F1KD to rise in the agenda. And for this, we need or, or the LGUs have to provide sort of hard evidence to show that. And on, in terms of, of whose leadership is going to be um, very important in terms of providing, say, the, the awareness or the knowledge um, and the data for that, I think our CHOs or, uh, or MHOs um, role uh, is very important in terms of swaying or in terms of really selling the, the idea that uh, we really need or they really need to, to work on the, the nutritional aspects and the F1KD efforts in the LGUs. In terms of financing, um, greater political will and advocacy um, are needed to increase resources for our first 1,000 days efforts. And the allocation and budgeting of resources must be needs-based and evidence-based. Um, what, what we mean by that is that if there are 
increase or there, if there is increased number of volunteers, for instance, um, there has to be also increased budget in terms of capacity building. The problem that we had um, encountered during our in or in our study is that this practice of determining the current budget based on the past or the past year's budget is really uh, something that gives a sense that we must do um, the usual thing. Um, so if you are given the same resources for this year as last year, um, it, it gives uh, an idea for people to just carry on with what they're doing. But in fact, um, um, when we look at the, the data, for instance, um, in this LGUs, we've seen that there is really this opportunity of improving this, the service delivery because there are now uh, more volunteers than before. So, for instance, in one of the cities that we looked into is that um, the number of volunteers like, increased by like 50 percent. But in terms of um, budget for capacity building um, and budget for their um, other needs, um, this budget did not increase. So I think that's that's, that's one of the, the problems that has to be addressed. In terms of m and &E, um, the LGUs, ha, um, they keep on working and doing things, but they do not invest in M&E, and this is something that they must also invest into. M&E is crucial in the uh, determination of, of effectiveness of the programs, whether they are, meet, uh, they are meeting their targets and that they are um, effectively um, delivering the services. And we've uh, we also noted or we want to recommend that um, OPT process um, must be improved. There's a need for adequate equipment and tools must be properly calibrated. Um, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Abrig a while ago, they use different um, tools. And sometimes when you ask the, the BNS and the BHWs, they would uh, provide different answers in terms of how they do these measurements. And so um, the personnel must be trained and retrained. Also, roles must be made uh, clear in terms of the implementation and processes must be standardized as much as possible. When we say ro roles must be made clear, um, it should be clear as to who or which is the unit that is really um, driving things in the F1KD efforts. Um, one of the, the observations that we had in our study is that there are lots of nutrition programs within one LGU and they are spearheaded by different units. So for instance, um, the office of the mayor has its own nutritional programs. The city of health, the city health officer would have um, uh, different efforts. And sometimes one of them would say, oh, that should be, uh, we should be doing that and they shouldn't be doing that. So there are these confusions and it's very important that roles um, are made uh, more clear and the processes be standardized. I know, or we know that um, LGUs have this, um, the leeway and the um, sort of um, independence or autonomy in what they, in, in their roles, uh, in their uh, service deliveries. And this is important for innovations to, to be developed uh, or to arise. But um, if, if there are uh, things like this, the fragmentation uh, sometimes can really be the source of lack of coordination and also, um, and that has lots of, of of negative effect or adverse effect to the service delivery. In terms of of program and service delivery, of uh, still there is a need for improving awareness uh, about ECCD F1 KD or first 1000 days at the local level and also among implementers. There's an urgent need to add health personnel, particularly midwives, to improve uh, delivery of service. And uh, I think this is a, a particular aspect that is very important because when we talk to people, they would say that we are waiting for our dentist um, to, to retire before we can um, recruit two uh, midwives. So uh, these kind of structural problems in, in our um, policies also have a very stark or very, um, how do you call it, significant effects in terms of the delivery of services. LGUs must also revisit the work assignments of midwives uh, to even out the workload um, and the schedules of community visits have to be well communicated. Um, one of the problems that we encountered is that uh, people in the areas do not know when is the midwife going to show up because uh, the midwives are sometimes uh, going into like trainings and uh, um, they 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 sometimes um, skip 
their schedules in going to these barangay health centers and so people are waiting in the area but then the, the midwife is not coming so the problems are really sometimes it's about a communication and it all also boils down to the lack of midwives because if if other if, if many with midwives are on training no one is uh, showing up in the barangay health centers to provide services to the people frontline workers must also be um better compensated and of course, given trainings in basic anthropometric measurements, data encoding, and um, effective stakeholder communication. If we want to provide LGUs with um, up to date or more up to date um, or less outdated data in terms of OPT in their decision making, um, we have to improve um, the the gathering of data and also so we have to capacitate people uh, who do the encoding also and the measurements. We uh, we are we are in unison and saying that greater effort and resources um, uh, must be provided for Gida areas, and I think this is one of the the problems in this uh, in these provinces uh, that we visited is that it's really the Gidas um, who have or where um, services have failed in terms of of F1 KD and perhaps the other also health services that are related to, to F1 KD because of the the really the, the constraints in the geography of the areas and so uh, for instance in one of the cities that we looked into although they sort of say that they go there quarterly what happened is that they just do it like twice a year and and this is because um that that those efforts visiting the gidas are really very expensive for instance in 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 Kalbayog city they they have this effort what they call baktas where in um, they would uh, pool uh, their staff, their health staff, and other um, uh, program implementers, and they would go up in the mountains and they would spend some days there and provide services. But uh, the LGU said that this is a very costly, um, costly endeavor, and so they are looking into other ways of 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 really reaching these people. Whether and 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 it's also good. Actually, they know what to do and they they have some ideas on what to do. They're saying that they have to a uh, sort of create packages of of services for like the whole family so that hindi lang yung buntis ang bababa, hindi lang yung isang bata ang papakainin sa feeding program and there would be services to the other members of the family also. So they, ha they have those ideas just as they said that they're just they're still formulating it. Also when we went there, they're just formulating it. And so I think uh, there are opportunities uh, for them improving their efforts. But um it's, it's really, you know, this is really geography if you're talking about Gida also. And so a lot of effort and a lot of designing, a lot of thinking has to be put into, into, that, into that part of the, the, the uh, service. Investment in well provisions and well manned health facilities is also crucial uh, in providing swift responses to, to the needs of Gida residents. And then when we, when we look uh, into the, for instance, the assignments of the Barangay Health Stations, the clustering although there are barangay health stations um sort of near this Gida residence sometimes they are not uh, well provisioned um, and so and that is also one of the areas that has to be uh, um, um, addressed there's also a need for more holistic approach for those in, in Gida um, so um because the problem is not just um access it's also about conflict um and it's also about poverty in terms of nurturing care and practices, LGUs must continue utilizing and strengthening platforms such as the family development sessions of the four piece and other similar um, venues to educate parents of nurturing care practices. So we found that there's a very um, there's a very good or there's a it's really opportunity for people to to come into FDS if they are F four P. So what the LGU must do is to really use this FDS to not just cater to four piece but also to other um, to the other um, uh, stakeholders or the other beneficiaries, or uh, I think it, it can be made into like an open sessions for for all in the barangay, like the mothers, the, even the the teenage um, teenagers, the girls, because um, F one KD the the health of the child also depends largely uh, on the health of the mothers, and in the areas that we looked into, teenage pregnancies are quite high, and so information and education campaigns for for women in general in the area and also all families um, 
are, are very much needed in terms of the, the information dissemination. Um, there's also need for more innovative ways to entice people to participate in government campaigns and programs. As I've mentioned earlier, there are efforts or there are proposals for this at the local level. What they're saying is that they want to, like, as I've said, mention the to, to formulate packages of interventions and and um, actually when when we talk to them, they are really very very how do you call this excited in terms of their programs. Uh, it's just that um, they're still under formulation right now, and so um, it's something that we we might want to examine in the near future whether they have but these have materialized um, in these LGUs. LGUs must also effectively enforce initiatives in maintaining clean surroundings and in mitigating violence in the community, which are essential to the proper development of the child. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, enhancing economic opportunities also uh, is crucial. In fact, this is uh, the most crucial aspect because when we ask um, the, the officials, almost all of them say that it's about economic opportunities, it's about the poverty. So addressing poverty is a must. Uh, addressing or poverty reduction strategies are uh, very much inconsistent or very much um, corollary or consistent with efforts to, to reduce malnutrition in the future or in areas. So it's um, it's poverty, and then if you don't address poverty, whatever you're doing at the LTE right now, even if you have bright programs right now, if you if you don't address poverty, there will always be malnutrition in this area and they will persist over time if this if poverty is not addressed. There's also a need to understand more deeply the reasons behind the lack of participation or cooperation of households in government efforts. Um, as mentioned uh, by, by, I think, Dr. Mike Abrigo um, a while ago, um, people have this connotation that parents are lazy when they do not attend, um, when they do not bring their child for feeding uh, programs. But, you know, parents are also doing a lot of things. They have other children um, to, to look after. It's not just one child. And so th there is even a, um, a story that we we heard is that there is um, a severely malnourished child that needs to be hospitalized. But then because the parents could not leave the other kids um she has she has many other the, the mother has other maybe three or four or five other kids what happened is that the child died because they were not able to sustain um or they were not able to bring the child to the hospital because they could not the, that mother could not leave the other children so it's it's really um a frustrating story uh, a really um what do you call this um sad sad story that we've heard in many of the, the discussions that we've had with parents, but so um, it's it's a it's um it's a multitude of factors uh, when we, we look into the situation in these areas. There are a lot of factors going on. There's geography, there is poverty, there is conflict, um, and there are, are human resource um, what do you call it human resource um, constraints gaps there. And uh, I think we, we need to really sort of make our leaders be aware of, of all this. Um, it's not just um, a say, oh, okay, we know that there's malnutrition and we are, we are spending some uh, or spending um, more on it. They said um, we have seen also the, the increase in the health expenditures, but we need to really improve uh, the mindset and improve the a, the, the, the ranking of, of F1 KD in the agenda of the local governments. I think that's all. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abrigo, uh, Dr. Dakoikoy, and uh, uh, Dr. Tabuga for your comprehensive presentation. We have seen the very rich data gathered by our uh, researchers from the um, three study areas, uh, Northern Samar, Western Samar, and uh, Sambuanga, del, Sambuanga del Norte. Okay, uh, friends, we are supposed to end at four o'clock, but with uh, your permission and with the permission of our uh, uh, resource speakers, we will have, we will extend our webinar for uh, several minutes to entertain questions. Okay, but before we start our open forum, let's have a quick break by running a poll. So, our question is, 
Which of the following factors is the most important in addressing malnutrition? A, political leadership and commitment. B, adequate health and uh, nutrition personnel. C, awareness and cooperation of parents and caregivers. D, well-funded, implemented, and monitored programs. And E, all of the, all of the above. So uh, tell us what you think. We will keep the poll open. Uh, during the open forum, and we will announce the results before the end of the webinar. Okay, so uh, we are ready to um, entertain um, questions. And for our first question, I'd like to call. May I call on uh, Mr. Michael Neil Angelo Bulatal of the Department of Health? Angelo, <laughs> your mic is on your question please hello hello yes michael your question please okay um since the um most of the gaps or uh, uh programs are uh very specific program michael we can we can hear you very well could you please um increase the volume oh, okay so um since financial resource is a major constraint implementing specific interventions. Um, what are the opinions uh, of the um, research speakers regarding the uh, Mandana's LD? And are we expecting that these LDs will allocate more funds for nutrition given that they'll have more share in the, in the next few years? Okay, so the question is, Michael, about the uh, uh, potential um, impact of the um, Mandana's ruling on uh, the uh, on the uh, availability of funds uh, of our LGUs uh, that they can allocate for nutrition. So just uh, for general information, so the Mandana's ruling refers to this uh, Supreme Court ruling on uh, a petition filed by uh, Batangas Governor um, uh, Mandanas, and the Supreme Court has ruled that the just share of local government units must be computed and sourced from all national taxes and not just from the national internal revenue taxes. Um, resource speakers, please, any one of you can uh, can uh, answer this question? Aubrey, Mike, or uh, Connie? Yes, anyone? Hi, I, I think... Uh, Mike mentioned a while ago that um, we expect that with the Mandana's ruling, um, there will be more um, resources for nutrition. And uh, by the looks of it, and when we're looking at the health expenditures, uh, for instance, even without Mandana's ruling, they're really um, um, also increasing. Um, um, however, what, what we really want to see is really um, a more significant improvement in terms of um, the allocation of nutrition or F and, and, and F1KD and related um, health expenditures um, in, in a way that will that will help LGUs meet their targets. As, as I've mentioned a while ago, um, my for instance, my my evidence of saying that the resources that go into this um, hasn't been adequate is that the, the the targets of the LGUs, for instance, they, they want to feed um, the, the, the mal malnourished children in 10 barangays. So uh, when I asked them how how many did they feed, uh, were able to feed last year in a sustained way, because uh, uh, schedule to it, yung feeding na to, like, if I'm not mistaken, 120 days, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So um, they, they said that they were able to do like only like six um, barangays, so children. It's, so what happened to the four other barangays, they have, they have identified the 10 barangays as those with the, the, um, most number of malnourished children, um, those that they need to, to, to have, those that they need to feed in their feeding programs. Ito yung mga ano, eh, moderately um, malnourished, kasi yung severely malnourished nasa hospital na yun eh. Um, so, hindi nila namimit yung target. So, what, what I'm saying is that um, they have to allocate that resource that enables them to meet that target. And so that's that's just one that's just feeding the others are also um 
the training of their the training of their staff so as I've as mentioned by by Mike and Connie a while ago not all LGUs are created equal so may mga LGUs actually that they are the ones providing the training for their staff in fact they they have the in-house um how do you call it experts in the LGU to do sort of give training to their BNS, to their PHWs, but not all of them. So another LGU, um, like it's queuing uh, for uh, for spots, for, for slots uh, of, of training of their BNS um, in the province, um, in the province capacity building programs. So yun yun. Pero um, yung sabi ko kanina, it, it has to, the, the, the practice of really pegging the the, the budget that you that you provide to like F1KD um, and attrition must not be based on what is happening last year. Kaya tayo hindi umuusad kasi yun at yun pala yung ginagawa ng mga tao. So when I ask, ano po yung, ano po yung process? Eh kasi ito lang, ito yung, ito yung ano namin last year. So ito din yung mangyayari for this year. So, ang nangyayari pala, so kung mas marami ako ngayon, kailangan pakainin. Ganun pa din, next year, 6 out of 10 barangays lang yung marireach ko. But this year, 6 out of 10, kasi last year, ito lang din yung ano ko. So, um, yun yun siguro. The Mandanas really provides a, a great opportunity for LGUs to to correct this. Um, um, sana, um, I, I know that roads are important, syempre, but, pero, uh, yung mga tao hindi po kumakain, nutrition po ito, ah, uh, it's it's really survival that we're talking about um, and and really um, uh, for me it, it's really the leadership uh, yung, yung political will ng ating mga local chief executives kasi kung, kung gusto nila mangyayari eh. so yeah we, we are hopeful but um sana um hindi lang siya tataas kung ano yung tataas nung <laughs> nung entire fund eh, kung, 100% tataas naman. Sana hindi lang 100% tataas ni nutrition. We, we want we want to, to to provide we want them to provide more kasi yun yung need nila eh. Sila naman ang nag-identify ng needs nila. So sana ma-meet nila yung targets nila. Um Mike um actually former PIDS president Dr. Lan has the same question for you on the Mandanas ruling and he asked, would you say that the Mandanas ruling is a good policy decision in the light of your findings on the extent of malnutrition and the lack of resources as a significant factor explaining it? Uh, uh, thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you so much, Michael. I think, uh, to the short story, I think the Mandanas ruling is a good opportunity to expand the resource na available in local governments. Uh, one of my worries, though, is that um, based on a study that we conducted like, two years ago, we looked at ano bang ginagawa ng mga LGUs pag, tinaas, pag tumaas yung kanila, pag, pag meron silang windfall income. And what we did was to compare ano nangyari doon sa mga munisipyo na, na bigla naging city. So, binigyan sila ng charter na city na kayo based on your resources. Kasi pag naging munisip, munis, uh, from a municipality to a city, binigyan ka laki yung share mo ng ira. Kasi iba na yung classification mo. And if we if I base my answer do sa, do sa results noon, what we found out was that hindi naman napupunta sa health, population health and nutrition services, yung extra era. Uh, what we found was that yung tumataas is on education, general services, uh, employment. And to the extent na yung mga services na yun is able to reduce poverty, improve the welfare of of the of their constituents providing greater access to resources, then maybe uh, although hindi siya direct sa health and nutrition service binibigay, baka yung mga households kaya nila maka-access on their own. Then, and that is just a question of saan dinadala yung resources. Another important question, uh, hindi lang sa mandanas but reducing resources is paano ba ginagamit yung resource? So, kanina sinabi natin, ano yung mga usual na binilalagyan ng mga pera Pagkakaroon kung may bank, kung meron ako piggy bank, saan piggy bank ko nilalagay? At yung different piggy banks na yun, iba-iba yung mga interest rate. Uh, karamihan ng mga nakita natin mga services na sa Nutrition Month Parade. At wala na pang masyadong impact, I guess, yung Nutrition Month Parade sa, sa kalusugan ng mga bank. And that is putting, importante siya in raising awareness, but in the grand scheme of things, there are more, ano ba, more targeted, more important, uh, you know, na more effective ways of improving uh, nutrition. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, Connie, Dr. Dakoikoy, this uh, next question is for you. And uh, again, this is from Dr. Uh, Gilberto Lianto. It is understandable why health and nutrition outcomes will be affected adversely by poverty, geographic isolation, and lack of economic opportunities. How do we break this binding chains? And um, this is also related to the question of Francis um, uh, Mark Kimba, which is, um, and this is about the four piece. And he asked if um, if you have found um, if you have observed some impact of the four Ps to improve nutrition, Connie? Connie? Okay, Michael, yes, Connie, did you hear the questions? Sorry, um, Connie, chop. Yes, uh, uh, your hello? signal is choppy. Hello? Mm -hmm. Yes, did you hear the questions, Connie? I heard the question, but can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. You can. We can hear you now, Connie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, addressing Doctor uh, Lianto's question on the binding constraint. Mahirap talaga ng sagutan kasi you know, uh, ang poverty kasi is, has always been here and kami nang tira da para mahal still here. So sobrang hirap sagutin ng tanong. Um, and his question was how to, uh, I'm going to. Uh, uh, how do we uh, break these binding constraints? And uh, for me, the closest, um, uh, kung baga pinakamalapit na, no? pinakamalapit na solution would be to focus on uh, the four piece program because the yes. the system the system is already in place, and all we have to do is to you know augment it. Because the reason why I'm saying this is that we did some sort of calculation based on this uh, four piece benef uh, um, existing four piece beneficiaries and those that are not yet covered. Marami pang hindi na ko cover. There are um, uh, households that are still excluded, and and then so if we wanted to 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 you know partially address whatever the problem on poverty is, then uh, let's let's focus on what's something that is already there. No, instead of coming up with another uh, uh, system or another solution, um, let's focus on on four P's, and then and that's why I was saying earlier that LGUs had have to rather has to. Uh, help these uh, households uh, in order to get into the program. So it, it's really needed. Um, and and uh, there are people, we, we did a separate study with Dr. Albert uh, earlier on convergence. Uh, and, and we found that there are uh, households that are excluded precisely because they weren't aware of the Listahana. And so they weren't, because Listahana is the, the targeting program and it's the basis of the the uh, four piece program. If you're not included, then you're you're ex naturally you're excluded. And and then some people are saying now we don't. The, the, when we talk to the the program implementers, they were saying now we really wanted them to get into the program, except that uh, they don't have the documentation. So the, the LGU really has a very uh, big role in terms of helping these uh, people. Um, get into the, the the program and then the second one that I was, we were advocating earlier was you know craft appropriate livelihood assistance program and i think that dr Lianto was asking something about the livelihood assistance programs uh as well uh for uh research or evidence that has something to do with with a positive impact uh mm -hmm. whether there is indeed a positive impact um um I think that Peng, uh, Dr. Ballesteros, is uh, doing uh, many work, or uh, her work is, uh, some of her work are geared towards the SLP, the Sustainable Livelihood Program. And then one, in, in one of her works, I think uh, she found that uh, there's an increased uh, um, uh, in terms of well-being, perceived well-being of the the uh, recipient. So in a way, if, if you're looking for uh, evidence in terms of, of, of uh, how these livelihood programs, assistance programs, are uh, are uh, are working? Then there is uh, um, there is evidence that it really works. I, in fact, uh, going to the social enterprise thing, um, my my daughter. Um, this this is this is not really systematic, no. The the evidence is not systematic. It's more of anecdotal, anecdotal evidence. Um, uh, my daughter uh, uh, had this 
field trip and then they were uh, they were saying that they, in this Gawad Kalinga farm they were saying that they used to be uh, uh, standby they don't have work and then suddenly there comes this opportunity to to plant and be able to craft uh, things uh, and and then so they have this this income already so meron meron mga anecdotal evidence that really show that indeed we have to look into uh, look at the assistance program but I think that one of the one of the closest would be let's 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 look at the four piece uh, program and and try to improve on it in terms of data, data collection, who are, who, who's going to be included, who's going to be excluded. I, I, I think that's it for me. Thank you very much, Connie. Um, our next question is from Dr. Anthony Calibo. Dr. Calibo. Dr. Calibo. Your question, please. Your question, please. Okay, let me just read uh, Dr. Calibo's question. May I know what health well, interventions well, aside from immunization are delivered in the context of the nurturing care framework in project areas presented? I I think that Sheila is for me because I was the one yes. who mentioned nurturing. Hello, Connie. Connie, no wala ka. Hello. Okay. Uh... Okay, let's let's get back to um to Connie to answer that question once she has uh, sorted out her uh, um internet uh connection. Okay, uh huh. This this next question is also from um, Doctor uh, Kalibo. Uh, how are parenting interventions slowly being introduced through points of contact with health and nutrition workers? Um, Aubrey, would you like to answer this? Let me just clarify the question is how? How are parenting interventions slowly being introduced through points of contact with health and nutrition workers? Okay, so when we when we talk to uh, frontline workers, um, they said that the, the way that they sort of provide some parenting um, tips or, or how do you call it? How to take care of their their child or their pregnancies, um, it's through the midwives and nurses um, conducting counseling uh, when they first encounter or when the, the mother first visits the the health center or the, the health station or the, the hospital. So that's how um, they, they sort of um, provide some, um, what do you call this, uh, not just in parenting, but also in, in nutrition and uh, um, health um, aspects and how to um, properly provide even I think um the the um, security and um, um, psychosocial uh, development of the child so um but um that's for those that we have interviewed of course um but it would be good also to know whether this is happening all the time and um when we talk to the parents um, from the parents side naman yeah they said naman that that um, it's the midwives who usually um, tell them what to do when they visit the, the health the barangay health centers and the barangay health, health, health stations but it's different uh, for for people who are in the kidas of course because uh, they have difficulty going um going down to the barangay health centers um and and lalo na dun sa mga city so that is um one aspect um the midwives um, do visit barangay health centers once a week, um, ideally, because they are moving from one health center uh, to another. Um, but I mentioned a while ago that there may be problems in terms of communication because sometimes um, the, the, re the the schedule of the visit of, of the midwives are not um, really communicated well to the people. So they don't know how or when they're going go to the health center and they're going to see the the midwife there um the problem also is that um the the as i've mentioned or i think we've mentioned a while ago in some others classes that's that's one of the the ways we're in the frontline workers or the bns can communicate with with mothers the problem is that not many of the mothers are, are going into this, these sessions because, as I've mentioned, they are um, occupied, preoccupied with other things. They have, they have kids, so if they have 
say small, small many small children are, are they going to, they're they're not they're not going into these mother's classes because they they said that they're busy so they're they're actually looking after their, their children okay so those are the the, the, the approaches um, thank you um uh al let's go back to the question of um uh Dr. Kalibo to, to Connie regarding the nurturing care framework. Connie? Uh, hello, Sheila. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. So about the nurturing care, uh, care framework, actually, this is a, um, uh, it, it, it's actually consistent uh, with the ECCD F1KD. So all the programs that are um, implemented in the ECCD F1KD are also embedded in this nurturing care framework. And the, the, the only thing that, um, that, that I think uh, uh, needs to be pointed out is that at, uh, at the center of this nurturing care framework is that the responsive caregiving. And I think that that is okay. one of the reasons why uh, UNICEF uh, wanted us to do this situation analysis and assess whether indeed um, the nurturing care framework is being uh, uh, implemented in the sense that um, how do people on, on the ground uh, do this nurturing care practices at, at, at the household level? How do they do it? And I think that one of the findings of, of at least um, the Northern Summer study is that the nurturing care framework actually is being done. It's uh, uh, people are already understanding what it is. Uh, they know the health and nutrition part. They know the uh, social. Uh, they know the safety and security part. But there is just one key that is missing, which is the learning part. And it, it, this learning part is. Um, I think one of the most important because uh, even in the ECCDF1KD, one of the strategic thrusts of the ECCDF1KD is uh, social uh, neurological stimulation. And, and so, in based on our studies, learning is is, is not still being mainstreamed in, in terms of uh, nurturing care practices in the sense that. Um, parents uh, or caregivers are still not uh, practicing playing uh, uh, music to the cheek kids. They are still not uh, reading uh, stories to the unborn, et cetera, et cetera. So in, in that sense, um, nurturing care practices, ito yung, ito yung importante, uh, responsive caregiving. And then you go uh, way up to the community, uh, up to the national level, hanggang sa papunta sa policy makers. Yeah, it's Sheila, over to you. Thank you very much, Connie. Okay, uh, our next question is from Jill Adana, um, former uh, research associate at PIDS. Jill? Hello, Jill. Okay, let me just read her, her question. Uh, I'm not sure um, if oh, you would like to answer this because you, when you conducted the study, this is before the pandemic, but let me just, let me read her question. Would the authors know if and how these LGU programs and services for F1KD and maternal and child health and nutrition in general have been impacted by COVID-19. Are these services still being offered by the LGUs or donors? Uh, Michael, would you like to answer that question? Well, uh, thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you so much, Jill. Yung sagot ko is from three months ago when, when I was uh, checking pa oh, what is happening on the ground. And based on the reports from, from because we have another study that is on reproductive health, uh, there are reports na tuloy pa rin yung mga servisyo. Nandun pa rin siya. Ang problema, hindi na makapunta ngayon yung mga magulang sa mga okay. facilities kasi yung, mm -hmm. uh, yung transportation limited. Although available siya. Although meron din mga areas na nag-report na kung may nagsabi na kailangan ng ganyan service, sila yung pumupunta sa bahay. So to some extent, meron pa din. Uh, medyo mahirap lang. Okay. Okay, and actually, uh, Luz uh, Divina Anu has the same question. Right, okay. Uh, our next question is from Maria Consolacion uh, Salcedo. Okay, given the findings of this study, there seems to be a lot more actions to be done to ensure that stunting and other reforms of mal on malnutrition can be avoided how now do you do we move forward in utilizing these findings and recommendations to refrain from aggravating the situation of stunting and other related ailments uh, anyone can answer this uh connie obri or michael brief answer hello yeah so um without the covid but uh, i would want to say without the covid um there but there is still the COVID but um, under normal circumstances what I what I would be saying is that 
this should start from um, the drawing board. Um, from the, the LGU perspective, of course, from the from the household perspective, there's also a lot of things that needs to be done there. But from the LGU perspective, this has to start with with planning, um, planning um, utilizing data, for instance. So they, they, they have this data, in fact, um, I've mentioned a while ago, they know their targets, they know the barangays to, to, to go to, they, they know the areas that need um, interventions. And so they have to really draft a, a, a well thought out plan that would help them meet their targets. So ilan ba yung kailang because uh, they, they have this uh, facility, they have this uh, sort of uh, mechanism to to um, calculate eh, what they need. Eh. So um, they just need to really be, be like the, the, of the officials, the, the health officers, the nutrition action um, officers really have to, to do some convincing that this should be done and the, the different units should come together and, and plan things out and this should be the resources that go into it and we'll see and we will monitor it and then uh, let's see what to do. And then for the household um, side naman, of course, um, importanteng um, malaman din or importanteng yung, yung household din, sila din yung magseek ng information. Um, it's, 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 is it going to be, to be um, there's, there isn't going to be significant improvement if uh, we are always passive. So we have to encourage households, families to be also more active in terms of seeking information, seeking help, uh, hindi yan lang yung laging nagaantay din. Um, it's true, no, yung, 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 uh, yung outlook natin, yung change should be behavioral then. We have to um, be more proactive in, in terms of, of improving the nutritional status of, of the children uh, in our families. We have to be um, more aware of what is happening with them. Um, and we, we have to be, how do you call it? yeah, proactive in, in seeking help, in seeking uh, information. Too, so, yeah, so... There are a lot of things that need to be done, as, as you've mentioned, dapat mad madaming actions, madaming problems, so madaming actions. So there is poverty, there is, there is a lack of opportunities. Um, but we cannot just say that, that, is, that, that no, wala lang kayo, wala lang tayo magagawa kasi ang daming problema. <laughs> Hindi naman pwedeng ganun na things should start, should continue uh, rolling, um, even with the pandemic. Uh, as Mike mentioned a while ago, nandun pa naman yung mga programs. Um, we just need to really uh, settle down ngayon kasi hindi naman pwedeng erase natin yung mga tao. But, but yeah, um, as I've mentioned a while ago, there are a lot of things that are that, that the LGUs are doing. Na ano nga kami, na amaze kami kasi, oh, grabe, trabaho lang sila ng trabaho. Pero what is happening is hindi, hindi kasi na, na monitor din if these are working. And, um, they really need to, to think things um, um, from the from scratch now. Lalo na with this this Mandana's reading. It's really a good opportunity. Sana sana hindi siya ma waste yung, yung opportunity na to. Thank you very thank you very much, Aubrey. Uh, before um before our um last two questions, a uh, gentle reminder on our poll. Uh, if you haven't answered it, just go to the. Uh, uh, lower part of the chat box, you, you, you will see their polling, and uh, if you click that, you will see the question. Okay. Uh, our next question is from Henry Tubura, and he wants to ask if in the uh, for these uh, family development sessions, if uh, the uh, if topics related to the uh, uh, first 1,000 days are already integrated in the uh, FDS. Aubrey? Okay, so um, when we talk to the parents um, and we ask them whether they have, sorry about that, whether they have attended FDS and all that, and they, I think this has been touched upon by FDS as far as the, the parenting, um, um, parenting tips and um, advices um, are concerned and I'm, I'm not just sure about the others because I don't um, I, I'm not sure if it's 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 if the FK, FKD itself concept you see the F1KD itself is ready inside the FDS uh, module um, maybe um, people from the SWD if they're 
here may maybe can answer that but based on my based on our conversation with, with the parents they've heard some um some of these uh, from the fds and it's about parenting sessions how to take care of their children and, and all that because that's um that's uh, the the four piece um families they they have pregnant women and they have small children also okay and for our last question um let's um entertain a question from our facebook viewer and a request my colleague uh wang to read the question here's a question from camille if health and nutrition services are crucial okay so let me repeat that again uh this is this question is from camille when you, we can hear you very well okay about this all right okay michelle since uh my audio okay gwen yeah okay so let me read it again this the question is from camille okay if health and nutrition services are as crucial and necessary in the nation's development why does the department of the interior and local government or dilg allow local chief executives or lces to have varying priorities and funding and sometimes allow us as optional programs projects and activities or pta so any one of our resource speakers can answer this question okay um michael can i request you to answer that um to answer that question uh i hope you were able to uh hear it well okay Sorry. Let me, okay let me repeat it it's this is from camille one of our facebook viewers if health and nutrition services are as crucial and necessary in the nation's development why does the dilg allow lces uh to have varying uh priorities and and funding and sometimes allow for it to be considered optional uh, PPAs or projects, programs, and activities. I agree that, uh, and, 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 and uh, nutrition is really, child nutrition is an important part of, of any human development and even you know, I think economy because uh, from a, from um, experience and from evidences, we know that uh, child nutrition affects your long-term outcomes on cognition and eventually productivity. So that's important. Um, dun sa tanong na bakit inaalaw yung DILG, yung DILG yung mga local governments, I, I, well, para mas sa DILG yung tanong, pero katakay kong sagutin, uh, the beauty of the local government code is that it allows you mga local governments to identify ano ba yung priorities natin. So, hindi, ang, ang, ano kasi dito, ang beauty is, hindi kasi yung ang sagot ay hindi one size uh, sa lahat. Uh-uh. So, parang ganun, 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 ganun ko siya nakita ng, ng beauty. So, kung bakit siya inaalo ng DILG sa DILG? Hi, Sheila. I want to say something. Yes, please, Connie. Oh no, I Go just ahead. want to yeah, I just want to add uh dun sa sinabi ni ano ni Mike kasi ang ang intindi ko dun sa when we went to the ground. Um ang ano kasi diyan meron silang gumagamit sila ng data in order to prioritize um projects sa L, at the LGU level. So that means meron sila yung tinatawag na annual investment plans and then meron sila yung local development investment plans and then meron sila yung executive legislative agenda. Itong lahat ng ito based ito sa uh, kung ano yung sa tingin ng uh, ng LCE or ng LVU that needs to be prioritized. And ang, ang ano lang doon is that yun nga, uh, Ang nagpipigure kasi dito is that if the LCE uh, does not uh, prioritize health and nutrition program and they are more into infrastructure projects, then what can we do? Uh, I- I- yun ang mandato ng ano nila. Eh. Hindi naman pwedeng, I don't know, I'm not so sure. Tama si Mike. DILG can answer this more. Uh, bet, I-, I think better yung sagot nila. Pero yun nga. Kung prioritization lang ang pag-usapan, there are plans uh, in place at the LGU level, which is the basis of, okay, actually, pag nga dun sa AIP, ano yan eh, 
Uh, it, it depends pa on the lobbying powers of people mm -hmm. who are attending the AIP. So there are programs and projects that are being uh, fielded, uh, pag-uusapan yan here on the table, which one should be, ano, this one, this one, this one. And and you you really have to be, have a very strong lobbying powers in order to get your project funded. So ganun, uh, parang ganun ang intindi ko sa uh, proseso at the LGU level. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it depends on the priority, uh, prioritization of the LCs and the LGU. I think, I think. Actually, mas masasagot natin yung tanong na yan kasi sa isang linggo, yes. sisimula na natin yung ating PIBS-DILG webinar series. Mm. Uh, and it will feature uh, the studies conducted by uh, PIDS, uh, which are commissioned by uh, the D Department of Interior and Local Government. And the first study that will be uh, presented next week is about uh, the uh, fiscal and governance gaps among uh, uh, municipalities in the Philippines. So, titingnan dito kung ano yung mga gaps sa planning, ano yung mga gaps sa budgeting. And so, uh, makikita natin dito kung paano may improve yun at uh, pa paano uh, mas, mas mapaprioritize yung mga uh, pressing issues kagaya nga nitong um, health and nutrition para hindi lang mga infrastructure programs ang laging uh, uh, nasa ano napaprioritize ng ating mga LGUs. Okay, so thank you very much Connie, thank you very much Michael, and thank you to Aubrey for your uh, enlightening pres presentation today. Our webinar today has shed light on the multifaceted and uh, interrelated um, factors on the ground that affect um, health and nutrition in our local community. So what we saw is really a complex scenario within, within with serious challenges as we can glean from the discussion and addressing these challenges requires a multi-sectoral and whole of society approach. So friends, please join me in thanking Dr. Obrita Buga, Dr. Connie Dakoykoy, and uh, Dr. Michael Agbigo for their very enlightening and comprehensive presentations. So please, uh, Join me in giving them a big virtual clap. Okay, and thank you to all of you for your active participation. So uh, let us now take a look at the results of our poll. Meron na ba? Uh, Gwen? Okay, so yung, yung uh, question natin sa poll natin kanina, no? So which of the following uh, factors is the most important in addressing uh, malnutrition? So, and the top answer is all of the above. So, uh, a total of 79 uh, participants uh, uh, participated in our poll and uh, 56 out of our 79 participants agree that all of the factors that we mentioned are necessary, are, are very important to address malnutrition. And these factors include political leadership and commitment, adequate health and nutrition personnel, awareness and cooperation of uh, of our parents and caregivers and having well-funded, implemented, and monitored programs. Okay, so at this point, uh, I now give you Dr. Reyes for her final remarks. Amsel? Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, everyone. It has been a very interesting um, discussion, and I think what came out was that local government units play a very important role in in um, ensuring that these programs are effectively carried out. And as what Sheila has mentioned, uh, we actually have a set of webinars, upcoming webinars that will shed more light on the um, role that local governments um, can do in, in um, implementing many of these programs. And so starting July 16, uh, we will be featuring the results of our um, Joint PIDS uh, DILG project, um, which has been uh, led by Dr. Um, Justine Sikat. And on July 16, she'll be presenting examining fiscal and governance gaps among municipalities in the Philippines. And in addition to Dr. Sikat, um, she will also be joined in that particular seminar by Mayor Cynthia Falcotelo Forte, Secretary General of the League of Municipalities of the Philippines, as well as Dr. Paul Hutchcraft, um, a professor from the Australian National University. So we encourage everyone to attend that July 16 webinar. 
And then um, we have on July 30, another um, component of that project um, and the presentation will focus on the Performance Challenge Fund and Seal of Good Local Governance, um, again, to be presented by Dr. Justin Sikat. And finally, on August 13, um, she'll make a presentation on assessing the CBMS as a tool in local development planning. So we have this series of webinars um, focusing on local govern local governance, and we hope that you can all join us in, in this webinar. So thank you for your participation in today's webinar. Sheila? Thank you very much, Mamsel. Before we close, uh, we have some reminders. Well, you can access uh, the PowerPoint presentations uh, delivered today by our resource speakers from the PIDS website. Um, splash on the screen and we will also email you the link. Please also answer the feedback survey that will uh, pop on your screen after the webinar. And in case you miss that, we will email you the link. And um, please don't forget to follow us on our social media pages, on our Facebook. Thank you to all our Facebook viewers. We have a Twitter account and, and uh, please uh, um, uh, visit our uh, website uh, regularly for uh, our events and uh, our new publications. And finally, please allow us to acknowledge the various organizations from the, uh, the government, academe, civil society, and business, and international development uh, community who join us today. You can see the names of these offices on the screen. Okay, so as mentioned by Mamsel, we have a very interesting series, that, uh, webinar series that will uh, start with next week on July 16, which is about the local governance. It's a uh, first of our webinar series with the DILG. So, uh, uh, for details uh, on how to register, just check our Facebook account. So this is our webinar for today. Stay safe and stay healthy. Maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Mike. And um, thank you, Al. Thank you, thank you. Mike, Connie, thank you. Thank you, everyone.